record button. You're all set. Okay, welcome everyone to the 12th GMT SAR short course uh, sponsored by um, Earthscope. And I'm Dave Sandwell. I'm the senior instructor. That means I'm, I'm getting older, um, just turned 70. And in a minute, I'll introduce you to all the younger people who are gonna take over this um, software development and probably the short courses. So I'm gonna share my slides. Uh, talk a little bit about um, this short course. Let's see. I think you can all see that, whoops. Okay, so um, this is just a brief introduction with the agenda and the photos and the objectives of the short course. Um, as I said, I'm the senior instructor here, but all these younger people um, you'll meet during the next two days, they'll be doing presentations. And these are also your instructors. We divided all the students into mainly into time zones and um, each one of these instructors worked with some of you. Um, so you'll hear more from them later. They'll introduce themselves. Oops. Okay, just a little bit about the objectives of this short course. Um, a lot of you are on different levels of understanding Unix and so on. So in the beginning, the, the main objective is just to understand the principles of SAR and INSAR and, and then learn how to run generic mapping tools and GMT SAR on your own computer or whatever computer you have, um, perform two pass INSAR processing, either using one of the uh, downloadable data sets or getting your own data, and then learn how to, how to select free and open data from ERS, NVSAT, Sentinel-1, and soon to be NISAR. Um, there's ALOS data is open, ALOS-1 data is open. And then learn how to process these various data sets using GMT-SAR. And then if you're really ambitious, learn how to prepare large stacks of interferograms for time series. Um, you need a sort of a powerful computer and a lot of time, but um, this is really the future of INSAR. I should note that this software development and is sponsored by the NSF CSSI program. Okay, a little bit about the agenda. Um, You've been meeting with your instructors over the last couple of weeks to install software and learn, learn about the GMT SAR. But the next couple of days, we'll learn a little bit more about the theory. Um, this first session is just introductions, um, a little bit about EarthScope and short courses, um, a review of the homework and your topography maps that you sent. Um, and then we'll stop for an online photo. Um, Melissa will organize that. Um, and then we'll have a short break get some coffee and then and then we'll have a series of of more theoretical lectures the first one on introduction to GMT SAR um, something about SAR theory and orbits um, then a, a lecture on INSAR um, SAR acquisition modes and something about SAR data access and NISAR and the community geodetic model something that we're doing here in the US um, but it's a time series uh, of application. And then tomorrow we'll have two more sessions. We'll learn about two pass processing, a tour of the data files. There's lots of data files and it's hard to become really familiar with them. Um, then we'll learn about phase filtering and phase unwrapping, a lot of techniques there to improve your, the look of your and accuracy of your data. Something about atmospheric artifacts, um, then a session on batch processing and time series. And then finally, we'll end up with applications, um, a series of application talks on volcanoes, earthquakes and post seismic, hydrology and crustal fluids, interseismic deformation, and then infrastructures. So that'll be today and tomorrow. And if you're, if you're in another time zone on the other side of the earth, there, there will be these, these um, lectures played back um, and, and you'll get an email about when to join if you wanna join in real time. 
day three, we'll, we'll, we'll meet again with our students, the, all the instructors will meet with the students in small groups and, and go over some of the presentations that work that they've done during the last four weeks. And, um, and then on, on day four, we'll have a time where we put everyone back together again and we'll take some of the highlighted presentations and, and listen to you, uh, the students. Um, I'm always amazed at some of the things that people have done with INSAR. So um, this will be fun for me and the other instructors. Okay, we've been doing this quite a while. We started this in 2011 as a very small group at Scripps with people from Sucesse mainly. Um, and we we're on the 12th version here. We moved to UNAVCO in 2014. We're start, sponsored by UNAVCO and we would have our um, workshop short courses at UNAVCO. Um, and, and that was before COVID. So we would actually bring people to the work, short courses. Things have changed, of course. Um, and then we moved everything out to scripts and continued with the in-person short courses Here's a photo from August 2016. We, Zhao and I did a session in, in China at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and that was really a lot of fun for me. I got to see all kinds of interesting things in China, including the Great Wall, and, and meet with these wonderful students. And then, of course, when COVID came, we went um, online by Zoom, and we were able to open this up to uh, many, many more students. And, Actually, this is probably the way to go in the future um, because you can, it scales pretty well. You can have hundreds of students if you want. Okay, finally, I'll remind you about the EarthScope Code of Conduct. Um, this is all uh, things you've seen before, but you know, expected behavior, un unacceptable behavior, and um, some of the consequences if if um, people get out of hand. Okay, so next I would like to introduce um, Rebecca Bendick, who is the CEO of EarthScope. And um, I think she's gonna say a few words about EarthScope and um, the short courses and the mission of EarthScope. Hi, thanks, Steve. Um, so just on behalf of the Aeroscope Consortium, I want to welcome you all to the GMT SAR short course. Um, you may or may not know that Aeroscope, the Aeroscope Consortium is the new organization that formed in January by the merger of UNAVCO and IRIS. And we're really excited about that because a lot of the work that you all are doing and are interested in I think can't no longer fits into the box of like this is geodesy or this is seismology or this is some particular geophysical domain, but we're interested in in using this really wide portfolio of tools to study all kinds of our system science um, and geophysics. So by combining the long history and expertise of Iris and UNAVCO, we now have a kind of like one-stop shop for you all to go to get support and, and training and all the things that you might need to be empowered to do your geophysics research. Um, and as part of our, our commitment to supporting the research community, we will not only continue to offer short courses like this one, but we're really exploring how to expand our portfolio of short courses to span different disciplines, different applications, different kinds of tools. Um, and we're also really interested in providing kind of training on different platforms. So like Dave mentioned, um, there's a lot to be said for getting together in a room with actual people and interacting. But there's also a lot to be said for making training and learning resources available globally to as many people as want them. So we're really exploring like how to offer both in-person activities and synchronous classes like this one that are virtual and even asynchronous learning tools like recorded lectures or workbooks or uh, self 
guided tutorial. So um, keep your eyes peeled in this space over the coming years to see what new offerings we have for collaboration and teaching and learning. And please let us know if there are certain tools or directions that you would especially like to see be supported by the consortium. One thing that's kind of relevant to the SAR community is we're shifting to hosting all of our data holdings and our computational platforms on the cloud, which makes them much more scalable um, and, and should enable y'all to do processing and data analyses, even if you don't have direct access to high performance computing at your institution. So um, we'll, we'll see how we can all grow together and super excited to have you on the course. And of course, as always a huge thanks to the course instructors because they are absolutely incredible. So enjoy your course and reach out if you have any suggestions or comments or thoughts about how we can grow together. Thanks, Bex. And thank you for helping us get through this merger of UNAVCO and IRIS and all the issues that went along with that. Um, things are changing, but I think I think it'll turn out really well. So um, piece of cake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I think the next thing we'll do is. Uh, a little bit more on course introduction and the homework that you've been doing. Um, and then finally, the topographic maps that people sent, because uh, um, it's fun to look at those. They're all very different from different parts of the world. Um, and so I think I just shared my screen. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about a little bit about remote sensing um, and then a little bit about um, in SAR geometry and that kind of thing, because it's sort of missing in in the uh, in the early work that you've been doing. So um, here's the agenda again. I won't go over that. Um, homework. I think the homework is really the most important part of this whole short course, or a really important part, because um, as I said before, different people start at different levels. Some people. Have never seen Unix before and, and don't have don't know how to use a, a text editor and that kind of thing. So even if you just learn that one thing out of this course, that could be really beneficial to your career. So that was homework one, learning Unix, getting your computer set up. If you have Windows, you had to find how to put Ubuntu on Windows, that kind of thing. Um, and then the second homework assignment was to learn something about the generic mapping tools, GMT. Um, and there's another short course that I think just happened on, on GMT. Um, this is a really steep learning curve as well. GMT is difficult to use. I still have issues, troubles with it, but it's really powerful and I actually do a lot of research with this tool. So it's a good thing to learn. Even if you don't learn GMT SAR and you learn GMT, you've, you've, you have some really benefits from this course. Okay, so that's homework um, one and two. And oh, the, the last part of homework two was to generate this topographic maps that I'll show you and um, explain why that's important for INSAR. Okay, so the third assignment, um, hopefully you got this far, was, was to um, install Google Earth because Google Earth's a, a good way to look at uh, these kinds of data and, and you can look at it in combination with all kinds of other data. When there's a big event, an earthquake, people will publish their earthquake seismicity and other things in Google Earth, and you can overlay this and, and work sort of in real time. Then there's um, a little bit about reading and, and theory, and that you can go as deep as you want into this. Um, there's a book that we're preparing, we'll talk about later, that has chapters and problems. And if you really want to learn this stuff, it's good to go through the, the theory. And then the, th the third part is to um, install GMT SAR. Um, of course, this sometimes takes a little bit of work, depending on your computer setup, and, um, and learn a little bit about GMT SAR. And then the fourth um, 
homework assignment is to learn how to get data, um, data for, that you might want to process yourself. Sentinel-1 is really the main data source right now, and you can get that from the Copernicus site or from the Alaska Satellite Facility. Um, and then homework number five would be to do this with Jupyter Notebooks, which is really the future. Um, that's where the young instructors are coming along. I haven't learned much about Jupyter Notebooks, but I should. I, I should learn something new. OK, so one thing that's sort of important when you learn about Unix is that when you log in, there's a file called .csrhrc or .tcshrc or .bashrc. This is the startup file that you, you put instructions in there to define your path. And here's one. I think this is from Eric Lindsay many years ago, a very simple one. It just, it, it's a bash profile and it sets up some aliases so you don't have to type a lot. But the most important thing, I think you can see my mouse here, is that it sets up your path. The path is when you type a command like GMT or ESARP, it's gonna look through that path and, and find the command and execute it. And if, it's, if your path doesn't contain for example, the GMT SAR directory that's on your computer, then you're, it's not going to find the command. So just understanding this um, takes all the mystery out of, out of the, uh, that part of the Unix. OK, so for the short course, um, what we want to do is get an overview of satellite remote sensing. I'll do this in a minute. Um, talk a little bit about amplitude, wrap phase, and correlation. What are these things? radar coordinates versus geographic coordinates. Um, it's important to un understand this because all the processing is done in radar coordinates and all the interpretation is done in geographic coordinates. And then um, a little bit about what is unwrapped phase? How, does, how do you convert that to line of sight displacement? That's usually what you want, how the ground has moved in the direction of the line of sight of the radar. Okay, a little bit about remote sensing, um, maybe more than you want to know, but I teach a class in remote sensing. And remote sensing is a very broad topic, including things like optical remote sensing from Landsat or Sentinel-2 and LIDAR and radar altimetry and so on. So I'm going to break this down into, um, into six possible ways of doing remote sensing. First of all, this this plot on the on that's going horizontal here is the percent transmission of electromagnetic waves through the atmosphere and the ionosphere as a function of wavelength. So on the left-hand side, so when you have a high transmission, it's having a window you can see through. And on the left-hand side, the window is in the visible mainly, and there's some other windows in the short wavelength and, and infrared and thermal infrared. And so, when you do remote sensing from space, you have to look through these windows. And so you can't, you can't just look at all the wavelengths. You can only look through these limited set of wavelengths. And there's really three areas. There's the visible, the thermal infrared, but way out here in the microwave, very long wavelength. This is the left-hand side is 0.5 micrometers and the right-hand side is in centimeters. So it's very long wavelength. The atmosphere is very transparent to electromagnetic waves. So this is a very a good, good area to look at the Earth from space. Um, now, once we define these windows, then we can say, what are the possible sensors that you could use to observe the Earth? And there are two types. There are passive sensors and there are active sensors. Passive sensors just look at reflected sunlight or thermal emissions from the Earth, um, things like imagery and, and radiometry and so on. Active sensors uh, illuminate the Earth with their own radiation. And the advantage here is that you can measure the travel time or the phase of the radiation and, and make direct measurements of deformation of the surface. So um, although these active sensors are much more complicated because they have to send out the waves. And, and where we are over on the left here is a laser altimeter in the optical part and the visible part of the spectrum. And then we have radar altimetry. And over here, we have synthetic aperture radar. So that's where we're working in this uh, INSAR and SAR area. 
wavelengths between about um, a few centimeters and the longest wavelength you can get through the ionosphere is maybe about 50 centimeters. <clears throat> so there's doesn't show that part of the window here, but that's where we're looking. So here we have our synthetic aperture radar satellite orbiting the Earth about 700 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. It's looking off to the side. It has a rectangular antenna that might be 10 meters long and one meter in width. And we'll explain in a minute why those dimensions. Um, and it sends out radar pulses. These are pulses going towards the Earth. They hit the surface of the Earth. They sweep across a swath and reflect back to the radar. And, um, and that's the information collected by the synthetic aperture radar over the swath. You can't look straight down because then you can't sort out the data in range. This is called range. In radar coordinates, this is the range direction and that's the azimuth direction, the flight direction of the, of the radar. So that's, that's the normal coordinate system, the native coordinate system for the synthetic aperture radar. Um, there's two things that you can measure, um, deformation and topography. We're going to be measuring the phase difference between two SAR images, and that could be due to motion of the Earth towards the satellite between the two acquisition times, or if there's if the reference and repeat um, orbits, these are going into the into the page here. If they don't repeat exactly, there's a, some baseline then you're going to be sensitive to the topography of the Earth. In most cases, we want to remove that topography. And so um, that's why uh, this exercise on building a, getting a topographic map is, is important. OK, so a little bit about the coordinate system and the products. Um, and there's three bands that we're usually working in. X band is about two or three centimeter wavelength. Um, C band is about five and a half centimeter wavelength. And then L band is um, about 24 centimeter wavelength. And they, they see different things on the surface of the Earth. Sentinel-1 is the main one we use now that's it's operating in C band. Um, and so when you look at a radar image, you have three uh, things you can look at. This is actually a pair of images because there's a re reference and repeat tracks. And so you could look at the amplitude or backscatter. This is also called sigma naught. Or you could look at the phase difference between the reference and repeat images. And this is the interferogram. And one color cycle is 28 millimeters of displacement away from the radar. So in that line of sight direction, if the ground moves 28 millimeters away from the radar, it'll create one fringe. And we're going to have to unwrap these later on uh, to make sense out of it. And then finally, there's a correlation map that's pretty useful to show how well correlated the reference and repeat images are. And there's lots of things that can cause de decorrelation, like water and snow, crops, or just shaking of the ground, moving all the rocks around on the surface of the Earth. Here's that same three data products at L-band, longer wavelength. Um, this would be like ALOS 1, ALOS 2, and NISAR will be a longer wavelength. And longer wavelength is better for vegetated areas. We'll talk about that later. But again, you have the amplitude. You've got the, um, the phase difference and the correlation. And now you can sort of see this is the range coordinate. And that's the azimuth coordinate. And this track, had the satellite was flying in this direction. It's called an ascending pass. Here's that mapping from radar coordinates to range and azimuth coordinates. Um, again, when you first make your interferogram, everything is done in radar coordinates because the pixels have to be aligned very accurately. Actually, there's a new way to do interferometry um, directly in geographic coordinates. Um, and I think we'll talk a little bit about that later. That's NISAR will have that product. But most of the satellites, we do everything in radar coordinates, and it looks upside down and backwards, and it's hard to interpret. And so at some point, you just want to uh, transform that into lat lawn coordinates and put it on the surface of the Earth. This happens to be the Ridgecrest earthquake. And, and so now it's, um, 
easier to understand and look at, although you lose a little bit of resolution when you do that. Okay, a little bit about the phase. If you, the interferogram, you know, it's pretty, got lots of colors, um, but it's hard to interpret. Each one of these fringes is 28 millimeters of displacement away from the radar. You could try to count the fringes. You could say you're zero out here and then count them up, one, two, three, four, four you know, and, and get the displacement, multiply by the wavelength, divide by two, and, um, and get the displacement. But there's an automated way of doing that called phase unwrapping that we'll talk about. And the first thing you would do is unwrap the phase to get it into radians. So rather than plus or minus pi, there will be many radians um, on the unwrapping. So here's an unwrapping of that Ridgecrest earthquake in radar coordinates. And there's sometimes errors that we'll talk about, unwrapping errors. And then if you, then you can just multiply that by minus the wavelength over four pi. The minus sign means most people like the displacement towards the satellite and not away from the satellite. And the four pi is because it's going down, bouncing and coming back. So there's a two way travel time thing. So this is what people normally want in the very end, unwrapped phase. Um, but then remember, it's only one component of the deformation in the direction of, of the satellite. So if the satellite is um, on the descending orbit, it's going this way, it's going to be measuring the component of deformation in that line of sight. Here's east, north, and up. These satellites are have a, always have a large component in the up, so they're very sensitive to the vertical. Um, and then if you have an ascending track, um, you'll you'll get the other another component. You don't have three components, so you only have two, which is sort of a problem. And um, and and you really want three, so you can get a vector deformation like you would get with your GPS. But um, Two is better than nothing. So, um, and then when we get NISAR, it'll be, it'll have, instead of being a right looking radar, it'll be left looking. So it, it we'll get some more components there. Okay, so just to conclude this section, um, atmosphere is very transparent to microwaves. So it's a good window to look through um, better than the optical window, because there you have clouds that prevent, um, the light from going to the surface and back. Um, SAR, I didn't talk about this, but if you were interested in just the SAR imagery, the amplitude depends on things like the roughness of the surface relative to the wavelength of the radar, the slope of the surface, and the dielectric constant. The INSAR phase, when you make an interferogram, depends on the line of sight deformation as well as the topography and also any delays through the atmosphere. And so um, in a minute, we're gonna look at these topographic maps. Um, and then finally, INSAR products include wrap phase, coherence, and line of sight displacement. Um, and, and again, most processing is done in the radar coordinates, and then you transform that into geographic coordinates. And so um, later on, when we walk through the data files, um, well, Catherine Materna will, will show you how to decide whether is that in radar coordinates or is that one in lat lawn coordinates. So I'm going to stop there from a, for a minute. I haven't been looking at the chat. Feel free to ask questions. Um, there is a question in the Q and A. Dave. Okay. I, the Q and A. Okay. Oh, I see that here. It says, how do you know, simply looking at the interferogram, whether the displacement is away or towards the sensor? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so one way is when you give gmt -SAR a color map and you say, this color is minus pi and that color is plus pi, then you can then interpret your interferogram by looking at whether the colors are going up in that color map or whether they're going downhill. I know that's a, it sounds sort of confusing. The best way to do it would be to unwrap the phase 
and then um, and and then uh, map it into line of sight or whatever. Um, okay, that's a great. Here's another question: um, Are the displacements derived via INSAR the same as displacement rates uh, derived from GNSS? Um, yeah, I mean they should be. But GNSS, you have three components. Um, and INSAR, if you have one interferogram, you just have one component. So what you could do is you can take your GNSS three components and, and find the look vector between the ground and the satellite and, and take the unit vector there and multiply it by the GNSS and get the line of sight from the GNSS. So um, yes, they should be the same. Of course, there's atmospheric error is seen differently in, in the two, but they should be the same. Um, these are great questions. I think we'll learn a lot about this. The baseline to measure the deformation in topography should, yeah, um, that's exactly. If in, I think um, Eric Lindsay will talk about this, but if you wanna make a deformation map, you would ideally want to have that baseline be zero. So you'd fly the saddle, the repeat one down. Um, oh, Eric's typing his answer. Okay. Uh, okay. And if you want to do um, topography, you'd set your baseline to be a specific number that we'll talk about later. Uh, Eric's answering. Okay, while well, he's doing that. Oh, somebody asked about, can we show interferograms having atmospheric answer? Let, atmospheric errors, yes. We have a whole half of a lecture on how to interpret these interferograms because they're commonly contaminated by atmosphere. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on, I guess, because I see answers coming up, but those are great questions. Um, share the screen. So, topography. Why do we care about topography? Well, um, and, and one of the homework assignments was to make a topographic map of the area where you live or do research. Um, and, and really this assignment gets you started on doing interferometry on your own because you're gonna have to assemble that topography map on your own and try to understand what it is. So um, as I just said a minute ago, the interferograms have phase due to topography, due to deformation and atmosphere sort of combined. We'll talk about all the contributions, but also due to topography. So um, and normally we only care about the deformation except when we're doing a topographic mapping, but talk, we'll talk about that later. But um, so we need a digital elevation model and in GMT SAR, this is called DEM.GRD. Um, and as I told my class to get started with interferometry, you just need three things. You need a folder with the two SAR images and the orbits, and then you need a folder with the DEM.GRD, and then you need this config file that we'll talk about later. But the DEM.GRD is, is pretty important, and it has to be slightly larger than the SAR image that you have. If, if you don't make it larger, it'll still run, but you get this funny looking edge effect where the, um, where the topography, uh, where the SAR image goes beyond the topography. And there are many sources of a high resolution DEM, um, and you know you should use all of them. But we have two that are sort of convenient for GMT SAR. One is called this Make DEM.CSH, and I've I started using that recently. It's wonderful. This is something that um, the GMT people put together. It goes out and finds the SRTM data and um, makes a, a DEM of your area. It also includes ocean, which is interesting. And then we had this old site topex.ucsd.edu, GMT SAR DEM gen, and that was broken until yesterday. We finally fixed it, but um, 
that enables you to go to higher latitude because it also has the aster of DEM. And then there are other sources. We should probably start using open topo and all these places that have, have high resolution DEMs. And so, or LIDAR DEM, whatever. Okay, so here's some examples. Um, and they're all gonna be very different, which is wonderful. These are all made using GMT. On the left, we see a shaded relief map with contours um, somewhere in Australia. And this is nice, it has a scale bar here, a north arrow. Um, it shows the locations of a couple um, places in Australia. Here's another shaded relief map in Indonesia. Um, they're studying volcano, it looks like. And so um, we would need to have that DEM to correct the interferogram of that volcano, especially. A couple more. Um, this one is much more complex. The one on the left, it has earthquakes. Um, again, GMT, you can do all kinds of wonderful things like have these beach balls related to the earthquakes. Uh, these would be uh, seismicity following a big earthquake. I don't know the details of this. Maybe we'll hear from Felix. Um, here's one of uh, Tigris Valley. Um, it has land and ocean. These both have ocean. You can see I work in the ocean, how crummy the ocean data is compared to the land data. Terrible, low resolution. Um, here's two in South America. Um, a nice inset map here. You can do that with GMT to show where this map is located. Nicely labeled, a subduction zone thing. Um, you know, you can do all kinds of wonderful things with GMT. Uh, a couple more maps in different parts of the world. Um, you know, here, this is a nice scale bar down here. Probably some of these people have taken the GMT course and learned how to do this in detail. Uh, Los Angeles and looks like a volcano somewhere. one in Italy and Madagascar. Well, that's beautiful. Uh, nice big map of Madagascar. Um, oh. I, I don't know. I bet these in the file names, they, they probably said where these are from, but they're, they're nice maps. A um, couple more, looks like Italy and both Italy. Another Italy, okay. And I don't know where this one is, but I should. Looks like a coastline up here. So before leaving this topic, I want to talk a little bit about the height system that's used in GMT SAR. And um, let me go one slide forward and then I'll come back. So this is a bit of a complication that you normally don't even think about, but when you measure height, usually you want to know the height above sea level. Here in La Jolla, I can go down to the beach and I should say, yeah, the elevation there is zero, essentially zero. But for radar interferometry, it's purely a geometric system. So you want the height above the ellipsoid. That's the, the shape of the earth that de best defines, the, the ellipsoid that best defines the shape of the earth. But the other height that we're more commonly used is the height above the geoid because then when you walk down to the shoreline, you get zero. And they're different systems. So um, when, when you get a DEM, you need to convert it from uh, regular orthographic heights to ellipsoidal heights using a geoid. And um, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference unless your baseline is really long, but if you, it can be confusing. So here's a map on the left, of orthometric height. This is a place in New England. There's Connecticut, Long Island. And you can see the shoreline. Um, I should have put a scale bar on here, but the shoreline is at zero elevation for the orthometric height, um, as, it, as you'd expect. But if I use ellipsoidal heights, the shoreline is, is now at negative ellipsoidal height. So this color bar made all this covered with water here. But this is the one you want for GMT-SAR. So don't be confused if you get your, 
your DEM.GRD and you say, oh my gosh, I thought that was gonna be uh, above sea level and it's negative, but don't worry about it because that's the way it should be. Um, one little complication. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and maybe have time for a couple more questions. Oh, then we're gonna have a group photo. Oh, yes. <laughs> I think Melissa's gonna organize the group photo, but um, if there's any more questions. Oh, is it important to have high resolution DEMs? Is there a minimum resolution? Okay, that's a great question. So let's say you're working in Antarctica over the ice. And of course, the DEM is changing with time. Um, it all depends on the baseline, the interferometric baseline. If the baseline is short, if, remember if it's zero, you don't even need a DEM. But if it's short, you can live with um, a not very accurate, not very high resolution DEM. It could be even one, even 500 meter pixels or something like that in Antarctica, whatever you can get. Um, but if the baseline's really long and you have some complicated topography like a volcano or something, you should try to get the best resolution you can. SRTM is sort of 30 meter resolution. There's a Terrasar Tandem X DEM that's 10 meter resolution. And um, yeah, so whatever you can get, although if the baseline's short, SRTM is usually good enough. Does the system, yeah, so exactly. How do we know the baseline? Um, so it's all about orbits. And we'll talk about that in a minute. You need to measure the baseline with the satellite orbits and know them, not just the length of the baseline, but the orientation of the baseline to, you know, centimeter accuracy if you, if you really want to do good stuff. So yeah. It, Software will do that, but we need the orbits. Um, does the three component contribute linearly and how to find each component? Yeah, so um, the three components, uh, remember that we only get one line of sight component, so you can't decompose that line of sight component into its three components because you only have one number. So um, that's where you can use the GNSS data to, uh, you, can, you can make a line of sight from the GNSS, but you can't decompose the INSAR unless you had three different look directions and then you can do it. Uh, how do we have time here? I think we're okay. I think what we wanna do now is have everyone turn their cameras on and we'll get a, a group photo. So Melissa, um, maybe you can help organize this. It's always exciting to see so many people. <laughs> I'll wait a couple of minutes because we got somewhere around 50 if I looked correctly. Yep. Do you have to do it in one shot or is it going to take three screens or how do you do this, Melissa? Well, you're going to be able to do it in one or two shots. Okay. Okay. Everyone wants to get their cameras on. Just what? I'll give them one more, just half a second, <laughs> thirty seconds. Otherwise, it looks like I could get everybody in one. Okay, so I'm going to do a short countdown in three, two, one, 
smile. Do one more just to catch, catch everybody. Three, two, one, smile. Great. All right. So I think now we'll take a short break. Um, how about we get, let's see, it's 1047 my time. How about um, at 11 o'clock? So in about 12 or 13 minutes, take a short break, come back, and we'll hear about um, a brief in intro introduction to INSAR by Jawa. Um, so please come back in 12 or so minutes. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, we won't get started for a few minutes. We'll wait for people to filter in. Um, and I can't remember if we're still recording or... Yes. Okay. I paused it, um, but I turned it back on. <laughs> so um, before I introduce Jawa, I should just say a few things about the international scope of the people in this room. Um, actually, they aren't all here, but I think we had 340 applicants. Not everyone joined the course, but I, I counted only 11 were from the US, which is remarkable to me. So we have people from all over the world, all different time zones, um, and we're trying to deliver this to the different time zones. And um, we broke the, the students into groups, mostly according to time zone, hopefully. And um, so those people on the other side of the planet will be listening to this later. But Jawa, who is in China, got up in the middle of the night and he's here to, um, I think he has a recorded uh, presentation on introduction to GMT SAR, but um, he's here to answer questions. You want to say a couple of things, John? Or I see uh, you there. Just keep it going. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I think you can play it, Melissa. Okay, we'll get started. This part will give a brief introduction to uh, the GMPSR software. Uh, so I am uh, Xiao Hua Xu from USTC, uh, which is University of Science and Technology of China. Um, because of the time zone differences, um, sorry that I had to record my lecture instead of giving it live. Um, so over this part of the lecture, uh, we'll briefly introduce you guys to the software. Uh, so we'll go over some of the designs of the software, uh, update you guys with some of the newer features and developments. Uh, I'll talk a bit on the newer or like relatively newer missions. Uh, so GMTSAR is an open source uh, INSAR processing software. Uh, it has the capabilities of handling most of the open source data uh, from processing a um, pairs 
uh, or interferograms uh, to doing a large stack of data using GNU parallel. Uh, it also has tools to do time series um, uh, with a little bit of atmospheric correction uh, implemented as well. Uh, but most importantly, it is completely open free. Um, that means anyone could take pieces of the software for academic and personal uh, or even commercial uses. You can copy it, modify it, or redistribute it uh, without, without any uh, restrictions. Uh, it is written in C for most of the processing modules and C shell to connect them together. Um, there will be uh, Python modules in the future, uh, which is already under de uh, development. Uh, the product of GMT SAR uh, is fully compatible with GMT for uh, immediate uses uh, to produce publication quality figures. Uh, which makes things easy to handle uh, if you are familiar with GMT. Uh, or in other words, GMT, uh, well, by the way, which is gen generic mapping tools, uh, is a popular software for plotting earth science data over GL maps. Uh, if you are an advanced user of GMT, you could easily manipulate the product from GMT SAR uh, using the functions in GMT. Uh, and lastly, uh, we try our best to make the processing chain simple and easy to modify, uh, so that later on, if you are familiar with the software, uh, you could build your own processing chain easily. Okay, here's a diagram of the design of GMT SAR. Uh, the entire processing chain is div uh, divided into six steps, and we're going to go over them uh, one by one. Uh, so the very first step is called pre-processing. Uh, the objective for this step is to convert the incoming data from different space agencies into um, a format that can be recognized by the GMT SAR software. Uh, this is the part where the software differs the most from one satellite to another. Uh, if every agency could agree on a um, common format, that would be great, but it rarely happens. Uh, anyways, this step usually converts the satellite's data into three files, which is um, a data file uh, coming with the suffix uh, .raw or that .slc, uh, which is just a big chunk of binary uh, numbers, um, and a parameter file with a suffix called uh, .prm, uh, which stores the, the metadata that can be used for processing the data file, and an orbit file with a suffix, uh, suffix dot LED, uh, which is needed, uh, which is the needed orbit records uh, for processing the data. Uh, and be, from one satellite to another, they are named under the naming convention called like ERS preproc, which is a preprocessing module for the uh, ERS satellite or ENVI preproc, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the second step is uh, called focusing and alignment. Um, focusing is a step to convert raw raster files uh, or raw radar echoes uh, into uh, SLC, which is called single load complex. Uh, nowadays, this step actually take, is taken care of by uh, the space agency mostly, uh, like uh, Sentinel-1 and ALOS-2. When the data arrives, they are already focused by the space agency. And then once you have the focus file, the, the next step is called alignment. This step, what this step does is it takes two images and do cross correlation at different positions on the image and try to match the two images together. So later on, when you are trying to do interferometry, you know that from pixel to pixel, they are actually mirroring the same thing on, uh, on the Earth's surface. Uh, the third step is called uh, back geocoding. Um, uh, it is a step to project topographic information into radar coordinates. Uh, so later on, uh, when you do interferometry, the topographic phase could be corrected. Uh, sometimes this step could be quite slow, depending on the interpolation approach you are using. Um, and we do have a sort of like a newer interpolation approach built in, uh, and you're welcome to try it. Uh, after you have this back geocoding down, um, then you have everything to do interferometry, uh, which is basically interfering to radar images uh, and filtering to smooth uh, your face and, and reduce noise. Uh, the theory will get covered later on, so I won't talk too much on, on this step. Uh, once you have the radar face, you could unwrap them. Um, face unwrapping is to uh, connect the fringes uh, from interferogram uh, to produce a continuous face ramp. Uh, this is necessary if you want to mirror deformation. Uh, it, it is more like an art sometimes, uh, and, and this will be covered uh, tomorrow. And lastly, you could uh, geocode your product. Uh, the information used for geocoding actually um, is from this step three, um, back geocoding. And basically we produce a large like lookup table. You have for uh, every point on the ground, it's longitude, latitude, and elevation. Uh, also it's corresponding radar coordinates like range and atmos. Then basically using this large lookup table, uh, you could project the, uh, the data from radar coordinates to uh, geocoordinates. 
Uh, okay, some more stuff. Uh, other than the processing chain itself, we have some modules or scripts outside of the standard processing chain, like uh, we have modules to do uh, corrections uh, to sort of split spectrum or split aperture to do ionosphere correction or doing MAI processing, uh, which is multi aperture interferometry. Uh, we also have time series tools um, uh, to, to, produ pr to produce time series uh, based on the coherence weight SBAS. Um, SBAS is sort of the, the time series approach uh, used here, by the way. Uh, we have some data manipulation tools as well. You could cut, paste, or reassemble bursts for TOPS data. And many of them are, are for Sentinel-1, uh, of course. And lastly, we have these top level scripts, which are uh, used the most, I think. Uh, they basically cost modules, um, um, they basically cost the modules uh, mentioned above uh, to finish the processing. Uh, if you have tried some of the example data sets, you notice that most of them are actually calling this P2P processing .csh. Uh, and we also have a batch processing tool, which is called a batch processing, but beneath is actually calling this P2P processing multiple times. Uh, so uh, this is sort of the wrapper for all the modules uh, to get everything connected into a processing chain. Um, here are some recent progresses of GMTSAR. Uh, most of them are um, like from the past a few years. Uh, I, I want to mention some of them here. Uh, we do have atmospheric correction modules uh, built into the processing chain. And like we said in the last slide, we have a batch processing and a P2B processing build, uh, which is a universal processing script for uh, all uh, available SAR uh, data sets uh, implemented in GMT-SAR. Uh, and we also parallelized um, the SPAS so it can run a little bit faster. Um, and to reduce the memory cost, we build an MMAP option so it actually can swap disk, disk space for memory. Um, uh, we have other modules such as the, the geocoded SLC module, uh, which may be used for later NICE R processing. Uh, and we also implemented the pre-processing uh, module for GF3, which is a Chinese satellite, and also NICE-R, NICE R product for NICE R simulated data. Both of them are for focused data. Um, and we also automated the orbit downloading script, uh, like orbit downloading step, uh, which is uh, implemented in this uh, script here. Uh, and also we are uh, on the development to um, uh, Python modules. Uh, this is mainly taken care of by doing you do, uh, which joined our team, I think, in past year, I mean, or two years earlier. And uh, the corresponding Docker image is also on the road. And over the past year, there are about like 72 commits. Uh, so the overall idea for this slide is that uh, we want to let you know that we are actively developing the software and any kind of help is really appreciated. So if you want to contribute, uh, don't hesitate to open an issue or, or uh, a pull request uh, on our GitHub page. And here is a summary of uh, some traffic info uh, on GitHub. Uh, so over the past year, we have about in total 300 issues opened uh, and they are addressed up to date. Uh, they are left open for six months in case any updates uh, comes on. Uh, so you'll see some of them are still open in the list. Uh, and averagely speaking, there are uh, about 130 unique clones every two weeks. That uh, actually sums up to about uh, 3,400 uh, unique clones per year. And down below is actually a, a plot of history of the clones every two weeks. Uh, you see an increase after 2013, but uh, 2023, but I don't know why. Um, here are some examples of atmosphere correction. They are for ALOS 1, uh, ALOS 2, and Sentinel 1. These are example data sets on the Topex data sets. Uh, like you can download these examples easily and feel free to play with them. Uh, um, but do want to warn you that uh, the filtering actually sometimes is a little bit slow, uh, but we are working on that. I think I said this last year, but didn't got time to work on it. Um, anyways. Uh, here are two new missions, or uh, maybe newer missions. Uh, it's been uh, for a while. ILOS-2 is an L-band uh, mission from Japanese Aerospace and Exploration Agency. It has a 14-day possible repeat, 14 day possible repeat. Uh, but normally, you get less acquisitions than that. Uh, it is free data, but you may need uh, uh, PI proposals to download high-resolution data. I think the scans are data are, are already available to everyone. Uh, Sentinel-1 is a C-band twin satellite system um, that has six-day possible repeats. 
Most of its acquisitions are in this tops mode, which is called terrain observations with progressive scans. We're going to cover that later on. Um, um, the data are completely open and free, and also ASF has a copy of the data uh, archived. So if you are going to download data uh, at North or South America, that might be a fast road. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, Cinta 1B died um, in Christmas on 2021, I think. Uh, but I guess Cinta 1C will get launched soon this year, or maybe early next year. Um, both satellites has, has really good orbit control. They have their advantages and disadvantages. Currently, they are the free SAR data set that, uh, used a lot in the Earth science community. And in less than two years, I think it's next year, actually, uh, NISAR will be getting launched. It's an L-band US mission, um, and it, its data is free, too. Um, but I think it's getting delayed a little bit due to the COVID. Um, hopefully, we'll see the data soon. And here is an incomplete list uh, of past SAR missions, uh, starting from CSAT uh, at the very early days, all the way to ERS and JERS, uh, and also the AVSAT and ALOS. Uh, later on, you have RadarSAT and RadarSAT 2, um, also ALOS 2, Parasat 2, which is, and also Simpson 1A and B, GF3, Salcom, um, and later on, there will be NISAR, of course. Uh, and at the very end, I want to mention this diagram uh, to you guys. Um, I always show these to the students. Um, so when my advisor, David Sandwell, uh, started to work on INSAR data, it's actually in the early 90s. Um, this is when, when he getting started. And when I get started to work on INSAR data, there's a drought of INSAR data because uh, in like 2012 or 2013, ALOS 1, 2, I mean, ALOS 1 and uh, NVSAT are dead. Uh, and Cinta 1A and 1B, uh, including uh, ALOS 2, are not launched yet. So at that period of time, I have no data to play with. So I had to go back to, to look at some early data. But if you guys join right now, um, you're actually at a historic high. This is only the plot for uh, the open star data, like ERS, and we said ALOS 1, 2, Cinta 1A, uh, B, 1, and 2. I mean, Cinta 1A and B, and NISAR as well. As well. Um, and, and this is only the, the number of acquisitions uh, to cover a certain place every year. And this is not uh, considering the, the, the quality of the data. If you think about that, then the data volume actually changes even more dramatically uh, over the past few years. So if you guys join now, you're actually at a historic high. It's probably the best time of, of working on INSAR. So that's pretty much uh, for this part of the lecture. Mm, if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask me or uh, drop your questions in the chat. Thanks. Thanks, Jawa. I like that last graph there. I'll be retiring by the time it really ramps up, so I won't have to deal with all those data and uh, too much. Okay, I, see, but, I see a question in yeah. uh, the Q&A. It says, is there a way to run pre proc batch tops uh, in parallel mode? It takes much longer time for a large stack of images. Uh, like sort of like INTF tops parallel. Uh, actually, currently there's no parallel module uh, for that part of the uh, processing. Uh, it was written at the beginning when we saw this step, actually you only need to uh, run it once uh, because uh, all the uh, reference images only need to be aligned to uh, a single master image once and then you can produce interferograms uh, among any of them because they are done geometrically. Um, but later on, uh, we also realized that the, the data actually increases really fast. <laughs> I mean, one way of uh, addressing this issue is that you can uh, divide your stack a little bit uh, and then run them in like several packs of, uh, of data and then put them together later on into one stack. Um, but that's not really uh, like paralleling the, the processing, but one, one solution at the moment. If there are other questions, I know Ang or others may have come into that issue of parallel processing and how you do it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I do actually have a parallel script for the alignment step. So basically, I use um, GNU parallel. It's it's very similar to 
the one in the inner inter tops, which is basically, you know, copy the files multiple times. Copy is faster than, than the resampling, I think. Or you can just make soft links, not necessary to copy the files. Yeah. Because the uh, the reference to me image can be a soft link to a different folder. And from there, you can uh, align each repeat image to that same image. Yeah, should, should be pretty simple to implement, right. I hope. Um, there's another question in the Q&A, which says, uh, which, which is, uh, what is the difference between batch processing and P2P processing? Um, actually, these two are the top level scripts. We call them um, P2P processing. Actually, inside, it has a lot of like, uh, lines dealing with different kinds of satellites. Uh, that's the main part uh, of, of what it does. Uh, and it also has functions of doing a specific part of the processing, the six, uh, like one or multiple of the six steps. Uh, while batch processing actually uh, uh, um, beneath the, the script, it calls P2P processing multiple times to do each of the step of, of batch processing. Uh, for example, uh, like when you're try trying to run the very first step or doing uh, um, or extracting data, Actually, it is uh, calling P2P processing for the first step multiple times to deal with different part of the data. Like if you have like 10 images, it's gonna go through every one of them and then call, to, call P2P processing to, to like process each of them. Uh, I think that's what it does. Uh, also, Catherine's typing an answer. So maybe you'll see that uh, soon. Um, the next question uh, is, is there a way to make atmospheric correction by using goggles with GMT SAR for single interferogram and a stack of interferograms? Uh, I think there is a user, uh, I don't know his real name, uh, but on GitHub, uh, if you search uh, the GMT SAR repository, I mean, uh, you'll find there's a user contribution uh, like repository there. And inside there's a goggles correction written by Elvis seven or something. I forgot the exact name. Uh, I, I posted the also. link. Yeah, yeah, that, that's link. great. Um, I think that's a way of doing a, a Garkos correction for an interferogram there. Catherine, we don't see your typed answer. Do you want to just answer in words? Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so so one of the differences between the, the P2P processing and batch processing is in the alignment as well. So in P2P processing, one of the images is considered as the reference image and the other is the secondary image that's aligned to the first. In batch processing, it's kind of the same thing, but one of the images is the reference image for the entire stack. So all of the, all of the other images are secondary images and they're all aligned to one, which means that the, the batch processing workflow allows you to get time series basically on a co-registered stack um, Whereas uh, pairwise interferograms, um, you would you probably wouldn't want to make time series with just a bunch of individual pairs. You would want to make time series when they've all been co-registered to one reference image. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Any, any more questions? Or... Okay, no questions. Yeah, it's too bad Catherine Guns isn't here. She, I think she has COVID and is recovering, oh, but no. um, she's she's been doing Gonco's corrections and time series and is sort of an expert on it. So yeah. she might be here tomorrow. The time series is a challenging thing just because there's so much data. And, and um, But anyways, there are good methods to do it. I think for specific areas uh, where you have really, really good coverage, there are probably like 400 uh, acquisitions there during the past like seven years already, so, which is amazing. And considering like for, for the really early SAR missions like ERS, you may in total have like around 50 or like a 10 year mission. Okay, well, if there's no more questions or you can keep typing questions as we move forward, um, hopefully we'll get to a lot of these things that you're asking uh, tomorrow or today. Um, so next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, 
synthetic aperture radar, not interferometry, but just synthetic aperture radar. And Eric Lindsay will talk about INSAR next. And then um, I also want to talk about orbits, because um, when you do any kind of space geodesy, like radar altimetry or with SAR, those instruments are measuring the range or the distance between the satellite and the ground or the ocean. But you have to know where the satellite is. And you have to know where it is to the same level of accuracy that you're making this measurement. So um, the orbits are really important and they're important for processing data. Um, so I'll, I'll say probably too much about orbits, um, but it's, it's sort of something I'm interested in. I should also point out that a lot of us here are writing this book. It's more about the theory and practice, not so much about GMT SAR. We want to have another book where we talk about um, GMT SAR and processing, but this is more about the theory. It's about two thirds done. Um, and right now I'll go through two of these chapters very quickly. Um, unfortunately, way too quick, quickly for you to pick it all up. But if you're interested, look at this, and then there are some problems at the end of each chapter, and there are solutions in the very last chapter. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit about pr pr principles of synthetic aperture radar, and then a little bit about satellite orbits. But you can see all these other topics are in there as well. Okay, here are some of the problems that um, I can't really address here, but. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about an aperture and what an aperture is and why we need a synthetic aperture. And so um, we'll go through a little bit of math on taking a single aperture, a single slit in a wall and projecting that onto a screen far away and looking at the projection pattern and how wide is it? And, that, and so there's a homework problem there on a different kind of aperture. Um, and then a little bit about orbits. Um, and, and the connection between the orbits and synthetic aperture radar. The bottom line here is that I'll give I'll give you the give away the answer. The satellite, when you low Earth orbiting satellites always travel at about seven thousand meters per second. You can't change that, maybe six to eight, but you, you can't change it much. And you have to pulse your radar more often than one half antenna length, and so that defines this thing called the pulse repetition frequency. And so um, if you could uh, increase the speed of light, of course, that's not possible. Or if you could slow the satellite down in its orbit, you could reduce the size of your antenna. But neither one of those are possible. So those are some fundamental limitations that we come up against. Oops. So back to our SAR um, geometry here, we have this antenna, it's about 10 meters long and one meter wide, and, and we'll say, explain why those dimensions. And then it's illuminating a swath off to the side. Typically, this swath might be 70 kilometers, although you'd like it to be 300 kilometers, something really wide. And we'll talk about um, the limitation on the swath width and how People are overcoming that with different types of technology. Um, so here again is the range and azimuth coordinates, the natural coordinate system for the, the radar. OK, here's a little bit of math. If you get some time and a pencil and paper, sit down and do this problem. Um, it's in the book, too. But the idea here is this. We have, we have this antenna. I hope you can see my mouse here. But the antenna is the hole in the wall here. There's a, there's a red wall, and we're, we're emitting coherent light waves or microwaves out of that finite length hole. And it's sort of like having water waves flow through the hole. And when they come out, they'll be diffracted, and you'll get beams that come out. We've got a center beam and then a side lobe beam. And the width of that is just. The sine of the width of that is just equal to the wavelength over the length of the antenna. It's sort of a fundamental physics thing. Um, and you can go through the math on your own and, and derive this. But that's going to limit how, how we can resolve features on the surface of the Earth. 
it's going to be blurred by this fundamental limitation. Um, here's the little bit of math here where you, you have the slit in the wall, length L, that's the length of our radar antenna. And it's going to project on the surface of the Earth as a sink function, sine x over x. And we measure the width of that projection as the distance to the first zero crossing of that sink function. Um, and, and we find that this sine theta r equals lambda over L. Just you can just remember that formula. You don't once you derive it, forget how you derive it, just remember that formula, because that's going to give us a real fundamental limitation. So let's look at some examples. Let's say you have an optical telescope out in orbit at some height. What do I use for height? 800 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And you want to say, can I resolve something? What can I resolve on the surface of the Earth? If I saw two penguins down there, would I see them as one penguin or two penguins? And, and you can go through that bit of math and say sine theta r equals lambda over L. L is the length, is going to be the diameter of this this is, you know, a telescope, and it, let's say it's um, one meter diameter, and the wavelength is only 0.5 micrometers, very short wavelength because it's optical. And so what you can see on the surface of the Earth would be 0.8 meters, something small. You could see those, those two penguins and distinguish between them. But if you go to the microwave, where the wavelength is orders of magnitude longer, this would be L band, uh, 23 centimeters, and if you make the antenna as long as you can, you can't afford more because you can't send something that big out. Well, NISAR is big, but anyways, 10 meters, you find that the, the resolution is 46 kilometers, terrible resolution. You couldn't see, you know, you could hardly see San Diego in one pixel. So we have to do something to focus that image, get it down to the small pixels that we like. Now in two dimensions, go through the same math problem. Here's our antenna out in space. It has a length of 10 meters and a width of one meter. It's orbiting along this way and it's sending out um, pulses of electromagnetic radiation. And they're gonna illuminate the ground in this pattern here with two sine theta lambda, lambda over L here and lambda over W. So the narrow um, width of it makes the a wider pattern. And if we look out and how that looks in space, we illuminate the surface of the earth and we see ellipsoidal patterns. And, um, and so that's what's happening on when we transmit the radiation, but then we have to focus it. In, and we focus it in two ways, one in range and one in azimuth. So the range is pretty simple. Um, if you just look at the, the data when they come back, as a function of time, these are your data points in your file. One row of your file is going to have these as a function of time. And you want to resolve two penguins that are a certain distance apart. What do you need there? Well, you can go through, you say you have a pulse length of tau, so you send out a short pulse. If it's short enough, you're going to be able to see both penguins independently. And this range resolution is just the speed of light times the length of the pulse divided by two sine theta. That's the incidence angle. So you have to look off to the side. If you look straight down, you're not gonna get any resolution. You're divided by zero here. So you have to look off to the side and, and you want a short pulse, as short as possible. Um, but a short pulse means higher radar bandwidth. And so that's sort of a limitation there. So this is the range resolution part. And then in azimuth, what do you do? Well, you assume that the ground isn't moving. If it's moving, it changes everything. But if it's if it's not moving, um, then and you want to you want to resolve this point reflector here. What you can do is take all your reflected echoes as a function of time. This is called slow time, and um, assemble them in a computer program and combine them. Uh, accounting for the change in the length to that reflector. So this antenna will be illuminating that swath there. This is a long track. And then when it moves here, it'll be here. And when it moves over here, it'll illuminate that. So this reflector is in the illumination pattern of the 
antenna for this whole distance. We can create a synthetic aperture. And the synthetic aperture, the length of the synthetic aperture is equal to the length of what's projecting on the ground. And so you go through this little tiny bit of math and you say, wow, the, the resolution in azimuth is just going to be L over 2, the length of the antenna divided by 2. Great. 10 meters, so we can get a five, we divide that by two, we get five meters. Great, nice high resolution image. So here's a dilemma here. Um, why don't we just make L smaller? If we made it one meter, then um, you could get 50 centimeters resolution, even better. Why not make it smaller? Um, so there's there's a real fundamental problem here that is related to how long it takes for the, the radar pulse to sweep from the near range to the far range. So here we're looking at the radar. It's flying into the page. It sends out a radar pulse. That radar pulse travels down here. It starts hitting the surface of the Earth. It's sweeping across the surface of the Earth from the near range to the far range. And then that's the end. You're, you're, you're getting your data back. So you're, you collected a whole row of data. Um, but you can't send out a new pulse until that far range one is over. So um, your pulse repetition rate can't be higher than the time, or the, the pulse rest repetition interval can't be higher than the time it takes to sweep across here. And that's just geometry and the speed of light, you know, triangles. So the PRF has to be less than that time it takes to go across. And so that's what's limiting the size of the antenna. We, if we made the antenna smaller, we'd have to make a narrower swath. If we want to make a, a wider swath, we make the antenna much larger. Um, and then there's another constraint up here that says, in order to get a full resolution image, the um, you have to pulse the radar more often than one half antenna length. This is like a Nyquist serum th thing. So. You have to every half antenna length. You have to pulse the radar, so that's going to give an uh, another bound on the pulse repetition frequency. So you have to stay within these bounds. So we're sort of constrained here by um, physics. Uh, now, when we talk about tops and and scansar and nisar, we're going to make this this uh, swath three or four times longer wider and so that's good but there has to be tricks to overcome this um, limitation so i'm going to stop there for a second and take time for questions and again this is really really going through it way too quickly you should sit down and, and do this but if there's any questions this would be a good time because the next thing is on orbits see anybody I probably lost everybody but um anyways the bottom line is that you can't have everything you, you can't have high resolution and wide swaths and there's always going to be some limitations um, on these systems questions all right So I'll move ahead to orbits, and I won't spend much time on this. But again, as I said before, the radar measures one distance, and you have to know another diff distance related to the position of the satellite to difference those and get the range, So, or the change in range. So you have to know something about satellite orbits. And um, so here's what a typical orbit looks like. I forget, this is maybe a sentinel orbit, and it's orbiting the Earth. It's at 800 kilometers, 700 kilometers altitude above the surface of the Earth. And we want to design the, the satellite orbit so it repeats its ground track every 12 days. So because we're going to need a repeat to get to do interferometry, we have to be within a small baseline that we'll hear about. So here's, here's our satellite orbit. Um, and um, so I'll walk you through this kind of an orbit, uh, this repeating orbit. So why do we need the orbits? Well, for a number of reasons. And the first one is just enable to focus that image, to, 
to make that blurry data that you collected into a nice sharp image and and you have to combine those echoes in a computer using the orbital information to get within an eighth of a wavelength like really you know millimeters accuracy so this it's it's used for proper focus we just heard about this if we want to go from geographic to radar coordinates back and forth <clears throat> we need to, to use the orbits to make that lookup table that goes lat long height into range and azimuth also to align the images Nowadays, all the alignment is done using the precise orbits. We used to cross correlate the images, but you don't necessarily need to do that anymore. You can just align them perfectly with um, the orbits and that's done with the Sentinel data a lot. And then when you when you make your interferogram, if your orbits are no good, your interferogram is gonna be tilted or have, have errors in it due to the orbits. They go right into the interferogram. So um, orbits are, used in everything and really making the processing um, more accurate and less uh, hands off. Okay, so how I see a, a good question. How is the raw, pi raw pitch and roll parameters of the satellite affect the data? Okay, so let's start with roll. So roll would be the satellite is rolling a little bit. Well, if you can keep that roll down to a degree or so below, you don't have to worry so much about roll because it's measuring the range and it's only going to affect where the antenna pattern hits the earth. And the same is with yaw. Although if you have a satellite that's yawed more than a couple degrees, the footprint on the ground will be ahead of the satellite, say, and um, and and so when you do the repeat, if they don't overlap exactly, you won't get any coherence. And they call that a Doppler shift. And so that's the, that would be the, the yaw and the pitch together. But um, so really you have to control the orientation of that antenna um, to less than a degree of accuracy. It's all built into the satellite. It's really remarkable. In the old days with with radar sat and ERS, we always had to look at the Doppler shift and say, oh yeah, do these Dopplers overlap or the footprints overlapping on the ground? But nowadays the satellites are much better. Um, so just a little bit about orbits. Um, there's two types of orbits. There's geosynchronous orbits and they orbit the earth once every day exactly. And they're used for communications and your TV, uh, direct TV, um, but they aren't used for SAR because they're too high and, and the signals would be too small. So, you know, they're up at what, 42,000 kilometer radius, way out there. Um, because to go once per day, you gotta be, have a or, large orbital radius. Most of the satellites are in what's called near polar orbits and they're mostly in retrograde orbits between about 400 and 1500 kilometers. That's sort of the range of remote sensing satellites. That's what controls the number of times per day you orbit, about 14. Um, and if you went through a little bit of math and you just said, well, the centrifugal force of of the satellite of this mass orbiting the earth and the gravity force have to be balanced. And if you set the radius of the orbit and it's circular, you're gonna get a ground track speed of about seven kilometers per second. You can't change that very much. So that's where we came up with that number. And that's what affects how often you need to pulse the radar. Um, um, I'm gonna skip this a little bit only to say that um, there's two ways of defining the orbit. You need six numbers and you could define them by these things called Kepler elements, geometric angles and, and so on, eccentricity, inclination. But the other way to do it is with, um, uh, with just uh, Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, Z, X dot, Y dot, Z dot. There's two, two ways of doing the orbits with six numbers. And, we'll, and the ones, the six numbers that we use in GMT-SAR are be the, always the Cartesian coordinate. 
x, y, z, x dot, y dot, z dot. Um, this just illustrates a typical retrograde orbit for a, for a remote sensing satellite. Retrograde meaning that it's orbiting the Earth in the opposite direction that the Earth rotates. And that's done for a very specific reason to get um, to make it sun synchronous. Of course, it doesn't need to be sun synchronous for the radar, but with an optical system, you need that. So, um, but that's a typical orbit, and almost all remote sensing satellites are in <laughs> these retrograde orbits. Here's a ground track of Landsat, another sort of illustration. And when you select data um, at one of these places like ASF or uh, European Copernicus site, you need to know the path number or the, sometimes it's called the track number. And what that is, is it's just counting the number of, um, let me go through this again, the number of orbits starting from one spot and just counting one, two, three up to, I don't know how many tracks are in this one maybe several hundred. So you'll see that the path number or the track number might be anything between zero and a few hundred. And that's just where the track is laid down on the Earth. Um, I already said this, there's two ways to describe the orbits. One is with Kepler elements, but the other one is with Cartesian state vector, it's called. And um, it just has time, x, y, z, x dot, y dot, z dot, and if you look in GMT SAR, there's a file called LED. And if you look at that file, it's just these numbers. It's, you can just more the file or whatever. And it's not a very big file. You only need to have one orbital element about every minute in this case. I think this is Sentinel. Because the satellite trajectory is so smooth out in space, you can interpolate to much higher precision. Um, and I, I think I'm going to stop there. The back projection um, relies on the orbit, and this is a this is a brute force algorithm that takes a point on the surface of the Earth and flies this satellite um, along its orbit and calculates the range as a function of time and finds the minimum range, and then says, "Oh, that's the near range," and then the time of minimum range is the azimuth position. So this is a common thing to do in, in all SAR processing. And this is actually can be done with um, GPUs. I think Howard Zebker does this all with GPUs. And so here's the, I'll answer this question in a second. So all these SAR satellites are in low earth orbits. Their ground track speed is always about 7,000 meters per second. You can't change it. Um, the orbits repeat exactly, depending on the satellite. Envisat was 35 days, ELOS was 42 days, Sentinel-1 is 12 days, NISAR will be 14 days, um, all by design. Um, and they really need act more accurate orbits. I think Sentinel orbits are, you know, five or centimeters or better. And this is really important for um, getting rid of these burst overlap phase things. So. Uh, I'm going to stop there, but I have a, I see a question here. So, using precise orbit parameters is possible to do the spatial adjustment of all adjacent line deformation maps. Yeah, exactly. Generated for a large area, probably using SBAS instead of using tie points. Exactly. You don't need you don't need GNSS tie points to assemble a large stack of SAR images all aligned to a few centimeters accuracy and, and knowing exactly where it is on the ground. But you do need the GNSS to correct for some of the range issues like atmosphere and so on. But the orbits, you can do it all um, in, SAR, in the processing. So they're sort of essential. Eric Scott. So um, 
David, there was a question in there that I answered just a, a minute ago. They asked, how does the yaw pitch and roll parameters of the satellite affect the data? Yeah. And I, you know, I kind of said, I think this um, isn't, um, isn't an issue with Sentinel data as much, but with ERS, I think it used to be a big problem. And we, we talked about focusing to zero Doppler. I think. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, the Doppler is the measure of the of the yaw and the pitch, how how forward or aft that footprint goes, um, and if the if the reference and repeat uh, footprints don't overlap, then you won't get any coherence. And with Scansar that we'll talk about later, the the, the scans are controlled to have high overlap. Otherwise, you don't get any but you remember the old ALOS 1 and ALOS 2, like when ALOS 2 was young, the burst overlap didn't work. Uh, so. One more question. What is the contribution of orbit and DEM to flattening the interferon? Well, yeah. So the DEM will be, we'll, we'll hear about that, but the, the orbit, if your orbit is an error by um, say 10 centimeters in, um, in, in the range direction, you'll get a, a slope across your interferogram, uh, some fraction of that. So you have to, it's usually a slope in the along, across and along the track. And you could remove that with, you know, in GMT, you could just remove a trend, but what if that trend is real? What if it's real tectonic deformation? Then you're going to need some GPS or something to flatten the interferogram. So um, Eric will talk about those things, I think. And I will talk about coherence um, quite a bit more also. So most, it's, so far, a lot of these questions have been related to the lecture I'm about to give, so. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Show my screen. Unless there's other questions about orbits. We will definitely talk about coherence. Yeah, no, I think it's time to talk about interferometry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, does that look all right to you guys? Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. So I'm going to be talking about um, INSAR theory. So a lot of the questions that have been asked um, relate to some of these. I hopefully will be able to answer some of them, although maybe not in as much detail as everybody would love. Um, so, but we're we're looking at this um, the table of contents of this book. We're in chapter five. I think that so David talked about satellite orbits and the principles and a little bit about the image formation, how we do the focusing. So this is kind of the next part of that. So um, basically, we're going to talk about sort of forming an interferogram, and then we're going to talk about all the different um, contributions to the phase um, and what all these things sort of mean. And then um, we'll talk about different bands and just kind of some general um, considerations to think about when you're making interferograms. So um, some terminology um, David mentioned when we have the SAR image, we call those SLCs. That stands for single look complex. So the term for look is a, some sort of a funny interferometry term that just refers to the resolution. So uh, a single look means it's at full resolution. When we want to downsample, then we talk about multi-looking. It's, it's just a funny old terminology for downsampling. Um, so this, these single look, they're complex images, meaning that they contain not only the amplitude, but also the phase. And so um, basically the, the simple, very simple concept of an interferon, interferogram is we just subtract the images, uh, you know, subtract the phase values. So we throw away the amplitudes and we just subtract the phases. And it's important to know that every pixel is going to have its own phase because there's a lot of roughness on the ground, right? If you think about what a SAR sensor is imaging on the ground, there's all sorts of different things that the radar is reflecting off of. So it's not, it's not gonna be like any continuous uh, image. This is actually a real 
example of an interferogram. So this is the phase values from two different SLCs. So one of them was collected at one time and then the satellite repeated its orbit, you know, after 12 days or, or 14 days and came back to the same place in space and took the same image a second time. And you can't really look at this and understand anything about it because all the phase values are random. But if we just subtract one from the other, then we see that there's a pattern. And so that pattern is our interferogram. And this reflects all the different contributions to the phase um, that we're going to talk about. So the things that are going to be in the phase um, are things related to the Earth curvature. So that's basically uh, our because our satellite wasn't exactly in the same place. So when we talk about the baseline, that's going to contribute to the phase there, as well as the topographic phase. Um, then there's surface deformation. That's what we actually are hoping to find, right? Um, and then we have all these other sources of error. So there's orbit error. If we didn't know our orbit exactly right, that's going to result in sort of an error in that Earth curvature and topographic phase removal. Um, there could be ionosphere. Um, advance or delays, there could be troposphere delays, there could actually be solid earth tides that actually affect the phase of the image, um, because it's essentially moving the ground up and down um, by tens of centimeters. And then there's finally some noise. So um, basically, when we when we sort of take a take stock of this, we know what the earth curvature is pretty well, we can model that we know what the topography is. Um, we relatively well know what the tides are. We may or may not know our orbit error and our ionosphere corrections. May, we may be able to correct for the ionosphere to some extent, um, but we probably don't know our troposphere very well, and we don't know the noise that's been randomly added to each pixel. So hopefully, if we're lucky, we can remove all of these and get down to measuring just the surface deformation. That's our goal, right? So we'll talk about each one of these kind of uh, one by one. So. It's kind of surprising that um, the Earth's curvature has such an effect. Um, when we think about these satellites, they're you know they're very near each other when they repeat their orbit. They should be maybe a few hundred meters at most away from each other, um, and they're going to be pushed around a little bit by solar wind and and variations in the Earth's atmosphere density at those really high altitudes. Uh, but you know they should be really close to each other. But if we sort of zoom in on that, there is a little bit of a difference in range. Um, and there's also a difference in the angle um, that we're looking at the ground. And so if you take an image and just make the raw image um, without doing any kind of corrections, it looks something like this. So all of these fringes across that image are mostly due to Earth curvature. And there's a little bit of wiggle and variation in there that's also due to the topography and, and other sources. So um, we can kind of calculate what that um, source, uh, what that phase due to the curved Earth should be, and also due to the topography. And these are the equations. So I won't go into the detail, but just to notice that this term that appears is baseline times the, um, the cosine of this difference in the angle between the, the two satellites. And um, we call this the perpendicular baseline because it's basically that component of the baseline that's in the perpendicular direction, um, perpendicular to the look direction of the satellite. So whenever you whenever you see people talking about baselines, we talk about the perpendicular baseline. Um, the parallel baseline contributes just a constant change in the phase to all the pixels, but typically we're not concerned with that because it's it's a relative measurement. So after we remove the Earth curvature, um, we see an image like this. So um, people from Southern California probably recognize where this image is located. This is like in the Coachella Valley. So this is this area of noisy pixels here is the Salton Sea, that's water. And then this is Coachella Valley, Palm Springs is over here, I think. And this is like Mount San Jacinto. So all of these fringes remaining are due to topography. And so we can actually use this to measure the topography. Um, and I think there was a question earlier about, you know, is the baseline important? So um, <clears throat> the first thing that's important is that the baseline is not too large. So if, if the baseline um, is larger than um, lambda over four, 
It's funny that this got pixelated because I just replaced this image with a non pixelated version. Um, I don't know why that happened. But um, if so, if you think about what's happening across one pixel, um, if we get more than one sort of fringe of deformation across that pixel, then we're getting it's going to be completely alias. So we're just going to get more than one um, cycle of phase per pixel. Um, and we can't really resolve that. And so um, this is, so we call the, the baseline that we have to be, yeah, so this, the question I've often heard of critical baseline, this is what I am answering right now. So critical baseline is the baseline beyond which the satellite interferogram will not be coherent at all. So if the baseline, so you can see these values for different satellites, if the baseline for ERS and NVSAT was greater than one kilometer, it would be totally decoherent. So as the as the baseline increases, you get more and more and more decoherence um, because of this issue where the phase is changing between the two just because of the difference in the look, look angle. Um, and so you can calculate that. So if you look at Sentinel-1, it's got, you know, roughly these are the values for Sentinel-1 um, uh, uh, the orbits and the height and everything. And so the critical baseline for Sentinel is about five kilometers. So fortunately, Sentinel-1 has its orbits really well tightly controlled. So the baselines will never be more than about 200 meters. So you typically don't have to worry about critical baseline for Sentinel. Um, but for some of the older satellites, you do have to look at it. And here's an example. Um, so this is from ERS, and this is data from the from the mid 1990s, and you can see that these baselines are about one and a half kilometers, sort of maximum difference. So that means you wouldn't be able to form some of these interferograms if they have too large of a baseline, because uh, it's bigger than that critical value. But if we form all these interferograms here that have mostly short time spans but large baselines, that's going to optimize for measuring the topography. So in the 1990s, this is how topographic maps were made. Um, is by by doing this calculation um, to you know to measure topography um, from INSAR. So um, this was state of the art back in the 1990s. Of course, the big problem with this method is that it's got a lot of atmospheric noise contributions in it, and depending on those baselines, the atmospheric noise might be a pretty large component of the signal. So it looks fine, but if you actually went out and tried to validate this on the ground, you'd find that it's not uh, very accurate. Um, so what we'd like to do is have a zero time span interferogram. So maybe we could fly two radar satellites at the same time next to each other. Um, and then we could estimate the topography without any atmospheric noise, because there would be the same atmosphere in the two images, and it would just cancel itself out. And in fact, that's exactly what was done. So SRTM stands for, stands for Shuttle Radar Topography Mission. Um, and so they actually flew two SAR sensors. One of them was in the bay on the shuttle, and one of them was out here on this boom. And then it transmitted once and received on two different antennas. And that allowed it to, um, to basically do this topographic mapping mission. So um, that was a C-band radar. And now Tandem X is a two satellites operated by the German Space Agency, and they're doing the same thing with X-bands. So they're mapping sort of even higher resolution, but um, at a different radar wavelength. And there's another one called Tandem L that, I don't know, I haven't checked the date on when this is supposed to launch. They always get delayed, but hopefully in the next couple of years. So if we, instead of taking a large perpendicular baseline, we wanted to just make a small perpendicular baseline, but a long time span, this is kind of an interesting interferogram because it actually uh, spans both of these large magnitude seven earthquakes and it shows fault creep along the San Andreas fault. So, um, so that's an example of a small baseline, long time span interferogram. So here's a quiz for you guys. What do you think is going on here? I saw this posted on Twitter uh, and I thought it was an interesting example of, of what happens. So, um, so this person said, you know, I detected a strong uplift signal at Mount Ararat. But do you guys see any issues with this image? I'll show another one. Here's another one. 
they sort of posted two saying, look, they both show the same deformation signal. What do you guys think is going on? So luckily there were replies on the Twitter thread. Um, phase, yeah, somebody says phase jump. You see this phase jump right here and right here that sort of outlines this square pattern. So what probably happened is when they were doing their DEM corrections for this interferogram, their DEM was missing one of its images. So they, the DEMs are downloaded in one by one degree tiles, and this one must have just been missing for some reason. And so they said the DEM tile was missing. Um, so be careful. You would, you would think this doesn't happen that often, but I see this all the time with people who are new to INSAR. It, something is wrong with the DEM, maybe they downloaded it from the wrong area or something, and they'll be like, wow, look at all this signal. That's the topographic phase that hasn't been corrected. So it's interesting to see that in a real world example. And David talked about this. Remember that when you download your DEM with this website or the makedem.csh, um, it's going to automatically down, uh, download and then remove that geoid height for you. But if you wanted to use your own DEM, if you're working in an area where there is no SRTM data or you want to use a different DEM for some reason, make sure you first remove that geoid height before you try to do your in-zone processing. Um, okay, so another thing that contributes to the phase is noise, and this is sort of what it looks like in certain cases. So this is from the Wenchuan earthquake, and you can see that part of the image looks pretty good, and part of the image is just totally noisy. So what happened? Um, if you guys are familiar with the Wenchuan earthquake, you know that this is um, in the Sichuan basin, and it's a relatively flat area. And then this starts the mountains that climb all the way up to the Tibetan plateau. And so uh, what happened in this area was, first of all, there's a lot of dense vegetation like trees and forests. And second of all, the ground shaking was so intense that in this area, there was a huge number of landslides. And so the landslides sort of changed the phase pixels randomly. And then we call that decorrelation. So they all, all the phase values just got kind of changed to a random new value. So when we think about um, what's going on physically in decorrelation, um, we have to remember that our pixel size is sort of few meters in size, but the radar wavelength is much, much smaller than that. So typically the radar is reflecting off of many small individual reflectors within that pixel. Um, and it could be that there's one particular reflector that's much brighter than the others, in which case it's going to dominate the signal. And that tends to make the phase more stable over time if that pixel is really, really bright. Um, and we call those persistent scatterers. So sometimes if you have a persistent scatterer, that helps to make the phase change less over time. But if you don't have that, you have these distributed scatterers. And if somebody comes by and kicks a bunch of these rocks over, you can tell that the phase is going to add up in a different way. And so you're going to get a, a random new value of phase um, when that happens. So um, in vegetated areas, um, longer SAR wavelengths tend to be more stable because they're going to reflect off of larger features like the tree trunk uh, or something like that. So um, that's something to think about when you're when you're looking at your data. So we'll, I'll show some examples of that, how the wavelengths affect the coherence. Um, but one of the things that we try to do to reduce that, that decorrelation is with filtering. <clears throat> so um, we have uh, two different types of filtering that are applied in GMT SAR. So the first filter is called a Gaussian filter. So we just apply sort of a Gaussian blur filter to um, the, the raw sort of uh, phase images. And um, then the second thing that we do is called a Goldstein filter. This is like an adaptive filter that was developed specially for INSAR. Um, so it takes sort of little patches of the um, of the image and it tries to detect the sort of the main fringe pattern across that and then amplify that pattern. Um, so for the Gaussian filter, you can choose the size of that Gaussian blur filter and the default is 200 meters. This is usually a pretty good value. If you really, really want to look at small, uh, very narrow features, you could try reducing that to like 100 meters 
um, or you could even turn it off entirely. Um, but it makes a big difference. It really helps the coherence of the image look better. Um, the Goldstein filter has two different parameters. One of them is the patch size, and then one of them is a value called alpha, which is sort of related to the filtering strength. So you can try playing around with those parameters as well for the Goldstein filter. And the patch size typically actually has more of an impact on how strong that filtering is than the, the alpha value does, but you can sort of play around with them. Um, and then you can compare your phase.grd and your phase filt.grd to see the difference in that filtering. So, okay, so here's a quiz. What do you guys think about this interferogram? So this is actually something um, that was a big concern to us in 2017. Um, I was working as a postdoc at the Earth Observatory of Singapore, and um, this place is um, Mount Agung in Bali, and it started to have this seismic crisis. So a large number of seismic events were being recorded, and somebody posted this interferogram to Twitter, um, and they said, look, huge amount of signal above Mount Agung looks like the volcano is inflating and it's going to be really bad. Everyone should evacuate. Um, what do you think? So it's hard to tell, right? Um, we could look at it and we could be like, well, yeah, it could be. Um, but it might not be real too. So um, what we did is we, we waited a little bit and then we formed the next interferogram and we found that we got the opposite pattern of signal in the next interferogram in the sequence. And so the conclusion was that probably this large signal was actually stratified atmospheric delays just related to weather patterns above the volcano. And so you can typically see two different types of tropospheric delays. You can see stratified delays where it's something like this. Um, so these delays, you can see this really strong fringe pattern above this island. Um, but the fringe pattern really matches the DEM pretty closely. And so what happened here is probably this interferogram represents stratified atmospheric water vapor that changed between the two images. Um, so you get a stratified, oops, you get a stratified difference there. Um, and here's another image from the same location. This one, it looks like just random noise. So this is what we call turbulent atmosphere. So there's no stratification here must have been windy on that day and there were some clouds. So this pattern is tropospheric delays um, that are from turbulent mixing. So this one is much harder to remove. This one, you can sometimes remove this with a weather model or something. Um, so in the case of the Mount Agung um, interferogram, we concluded this is probably not real deformation, but you know there was still something going on. And in fact, the, the volcano did erupt. Um, so, <laughs> It's an interesting case where, you know, the INSAR didn't quite show us what we wanted to know. Um, but, um, but yeah, it wasn't as big of an eruption as some people had feared. So it didn't really get out of the caldera, uh, the crater at the top of the mountain. So people were okay. Um, so here's another case of uh, an atmospheric artifact that you can see. This is due to the ionosphere. So this huge number of fringes across the image occurring sort of almost like a plane. It looks like that earth curvature hasn't been correctly removed, but this is actually caused by the ionosphere. So the ionosphere can have really strong variations. Um, and uh, between two images, if it changed a lot, you'll get these kind of big delays. Sometimes you see streaky patterns like this. Um, so this is kind of an example where you see this really streaky thing. This was some sort of like waves in the ionosphere um, that were passing through at the time that the satellite took its image. Um, so there is this split spectrum approach. Um, I think Xiaohua mentioned that. So we'll talk about how to apply that later. Um, but so it looks something like this. So this is an image from Bangladesh from the ALS-2 satellite um, put together by my student Jinghan Chong. And uh, he's been working in this area, and we saw a lot of this really strong ionospheric disturbances, but we can remove it and, and get, you know, a much cleaner image using that split spectrum approach. So this works sometimes, it doesn't always work. Um, so it's something you have to sort of be aware of, not a perfect correction. Um, sometimes it, it fails for various reasons. So, okay, so I think this is the last 
um, part of the, the talk. So talking about the different wavelength effects. So um, if you look at um, what satellite data is available, most of the satellites that are currently operating are X band, three centimeter wavelengths, uh, C band, which is a six centimeter wavelength and L band, which is a 24 centimeter wavelength. So if these names are confusing to you, um, that's actually intentional. Um, <laughs> the names were developed, um, I think, by the Allies during World War II when they were developing these different radar techniques and um, they wanted to confuse um, their enemies. So they sort of changed, they made them really confusing names on purpose. So sorry about that. X is the shortest, C is the middle, L is the longest, um, but there's no consistency. The next longest one after L is called uh, P, and I think S is somewhere in the middle. Um, it's just it's just intentionally confusing. But um, if you think about what happens to vegetation, um, an X-band SAR sensor is mostly reflecting off of things that are about three centimeters in size. So it tends to reflect off of the leaves of trees. The C-band is going to reflect maybe off of small branches of the trees, and the L-band is going to reflect off of sort of the tree trunks. And then if you go even longer, um, from P band, then they don't have the names anymore, but the longer wavelengths can reflect, can get all the way through the trees and just reflect off the ground surface. So L band is going to generally be better in vegetated areas because it's reflecting off the tree trunks, whereas the X and C are reflecting off of these, you know, these leaves and things up at the, at the tops of the trees that are really variable and constantly subject to a lot of noise. So here's an example from Kilauea. This was actually uh, an early mission from the 1990s where they flew an instrument called SIR-C and um, the C band image is here. So this is this contains the topographic phase. Um, and so you can see the more dense topographic fringes, um, but they're losing the coherence and all these areas here are vegetated. So this vegetation is causing decorrelation. Whereas with this L band uh, one, this one is, you can see that there's a little bit of loss of coherence, but it's not as bad because the, um, the, the radar is able to reflect off of the tree trunks. So it's much more stable in phase. Here's another example. So um, this is an interferogram from an X-band satellite, an Italian satellite called Cosmo SkyMed. Um, and it's actually a constellation of several uh, satellites. So they're able to do really short repeat time, but you can see that in this area in Italy, um, the La Aquila earthquake occurred. You can see a little bit of fringe pattern here, but mostly because of vegetation, we lost the signal. So uh, X band will be decorrelated even in uh, generally like small vegetation, like bushes and, and grasslands and everything, it will lose signal. Um, so here's a C band image of the same location. So we see a Lachula is here. This is an image from the Envisat satellite. Um, and you can see the fringe pattern much better, right? So there's still some decorrelation in the more forested areas, but the grasslands and, and shrubbery is kind of coming out okay. So you can actually map the deformation relatively well um, in this case. And then if we look at an L-band image for the same earthquake, this is from ALIS-1, yeah, you can see that it's it's only like one fringe, right? Because the deformation is half of the, the number of fringes is half the radar wavelength. So this is 24 centimeters. So this is about 12 centimeters of displacement. Um, so we, but we don't have really any decorrelation patterns, maybe just a few little small areas of decorrelation, but otherwise it's almost perfectly correlated. Um, you might also notice that this one tends to the, um, the L-band satellites tend to be a little bit lower resolution as well, so it's not quite as high resolution as here, although I think that might have just been a choice in how they're presenting this image. They could probably have put it at a higher resolution for the product. So, okay, so that's basically what I have um, for these slides. Um, some kind of general considerations when you're choosing your interferograms and making them. Um, you should try to make images with a small perpendicular baseline whenever possible if you're interested in deformation, um, because as that perpendicular baseline increases, it just it just makes your coherence get worse and worse. So it's always better to have smaller perpendicular baselines, um, and that's especially true in areas of steep topography where the you know the um, 
you could get decorrelation happening, you know, even more. Um, then, you know, we need that precise orbit information. Um, this is generally fine with today's modern satellites. Um, so it's not something we usually have to worry about too much. Although you should be aware that, you know, for Sentinel, um, the final orbits are provided about two weeks after the image is collected. So if you try to make an infogram within two weeks of the image being collected, you'll be using uh, your, uh, the, they call them restituted orbits, which are like the rapid orbits, and they might not be as accurate, but usually it works out just fine, actually. Um, and then densely vegetated areas, so you're going to want to look for longer wavelength SAR satellites to get good coherence in a densely vegetated area. So fortunately, NISAR is coming up, hopefully next year. Um, you can look at ALOS or ALOS2 data. Um, otherwise, you know, most people are using Sentinel data nowadays because there's just so much of it available. But it has limitations in these densely vegetated areas, and there's some, some areas that we just can't really study very effectively with Sentinel data. Um, and then finally, unfortunately, atmospheric effects, especially troposphere, are not generally sort of directly removable by simple means, but um, we'll talk about some, some advanced methods for how to remove those, I think, mostly tomorrow. So, okay. So questions. Um, there was a question, what is the contribution of orbit and DEM in flattening? I think I answered that, right? So I answered that. How is the coherence calculated? Yes, okay, that's a good question. Um, so the coherence is calculated, this is actually calculated differently um, by GMT-SAR and other um, methods like ICE. So um, GMT-SAR, the equation is in the book, but it the, the coherence has to do with sort of this, the variation in both the um, the amplitude and the phase of the pixel. Um, so it's a, it's a complex formula where you sort of take the complex conjugate of one image and multiply by the other one. Um, in the case of ICE and other, uh, some other SAR processors, they calculate it using what we call the, uh, the phase sigma. So it's just like you take a little window around the, the pixel and it's just the noisiness of that window of the phase. Um, so that depends on other pixels, whereas the GMT SAR calculation of coherence is based only on the individual pixel itself. So you actually get a higher resolution estimate of the coherence with GMT SAR, um, but the numbers are different than what you'll see in, in other satellite uh, SAR processors. So Eric, to put it on that, sometimes we see temporal coherence, sometimes we see spatial coherence, Actually, I also have a confusion. Do, do you know in GMT SAR the calculation of the coherence is that temporal coherence or it's spatial coherence? I guess based on what you described, GMT SAR calculates the temporal coherence, right? Because that's pixel by pixel, even though it has an average. Actually, GMT SAR has average by three by three. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question for David. I'm not 100% sure. I think it's averaged over the same filter that's used for filtering the phase. So if it's a 200 meter Gaussian filter, it uses a 200 meter Gaussian shape. Of the okay. Phase. So it's still averaging its neighbors. So it's a spatial coherence. Yeah, it's spatial. Yeah. Okay. I see a great, quite another question. Um, a lot of the questions were answered about reflections off of water. And, and I think those were good question answers, but um, you see this new one? I would check the perpendicular baseline, incidence angle, azimuth, heading using GMT SAR. I mean, I, I can answer that. There's a tool called SAT underscore baseline, and you give it, um, you go to the SLC directory where the where the SLCs were generated, and you give it the two PRM files of the reference and repeat, and it returns the baseline. Um, of course, the yeah. baseline is different at every pixel and range because it depends a little on the angle. When you do your, if you do your processing, like with the batch processing, it'll create a file called baseline table, and that's going to contain that perpendicular baseline. The incidence angle and azimuth, um, that part you get at the very end of the processing where you get the sat. There's another command called sat underscore look. And when you run that for, for a location, it'll tell you those values like the, 
the east, north, and up components, or the incidence angle and the azimuth angle. Um, so, so yeah, you can get those values after you're done with the processing. Um, yeah, and the last split question, spectrum. Yeah. split spectrum. Yeah, I think it's implemented. Um, maybe Xiaohua's lecture tomorrow will cover that more. Is he here? I think he might have he, gone he back to bed. It's like three in the morning. <laughs> um, but there is a, a switch where you can turn it on. But as Eric Lindsay said, it's sometimes unreliable because these satellites were not designed for split spectrum, whereas NISAR will be designed specifically for getting good results, split spectrum corrections. But for example, ALOS2 doesn't have enough bandwidth to get a good result. And so, I don't know. I, I haven't, yeah. Eric, you, you know, said you we, experimented with it, but yeah. When you, when you think about what's happening in the split spectrum method, you're splitting the, the Doppler spectrum, which is sort of like the satellite is looking ahead and looking behind for part of the image and part of the image. So you split that in two. And it's a it's sort of hard to understand exactly how that works with Fourier transforms, but that's fundamentally the concept of what you're doing is splitting the, the part of the images looking forward and the part that's looking backward. And then you make two new images with those, and they're gonna have different ionosphere because it, part of the image was looking backward and forward. So there's sort of a shift in the satellite location for those two images. Um, but that noise goes up by quite a bit because you've taken only half of your data to form the image. So you're gonna get much worse coherence in those two images. And then what happens to estimate the ionosphere, you have to take those two images and unwrap them and then subtract the unwrapped versions of those two images. And so if you have too much decorrelation, you just can't unwrap those images. Um, and as a result, you get these weird errors related to the unwrapping errors that make the ionosphere correction fail. So um, what we found in the case of the areas like in Bangladesh, um, areas that are sort of close to the magnetic equator, um, which is close to the, the regular equator, but slightly off from it because the magnetic pole isn't aligned exactly. But where you're close to that equator, you get really, really strong variations on ionosphere. And so Bangladesh happens to be right in the middle of that. And some of our images have hundreds of fringes, like hundreds and hundreds of, of fringes related to ionosphere. And we just weren't able to unwrap those images successfully. So we ended up having to throw away about half of our data <laughs> in order to make, you know, we just kept the interferograms where the correction worked correctly. And we got enough that we could still make a time series, but um, we don't have as much data as we'd like. So it's still a bit noisy. Those are great questions. And the, there, was, there was a question earlier about the, the hydrology. Um, Wes, I, Wes answered it, but yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a cool question. Like if you, if you think about, um, you know, one of the things that people often do with SAR is just map presence of water using that sort of like the radar amplitude or coherence change. So, yeah. So you can you can use it to map the extent of the water, but you can't actually necessarily do like a an INSAR on the water itself. So yeah, I think I, I agree with Wes's answer. That's a good answer. Okay. So surprisingly, L band exhibits yeah. more atmospheric delay than C band. That's actually that's yeah, so it may be surprising to you, but it turns out there's a reason for that mathematically. Um, the ionospheric delay is related to the square of the radar frequency. And so the, um, the radar frequency for L band is about uh, one fourth of the radar frequency for the um, for C band. And so then the square of that is 16. So um, it's, or I think it's related to one over the frequency squared. So yeah, so it's, it's actually about 16 times stronger ionosphere effect from L band data than C band data. And that's the case everywhere. That's expected. Um, it's one of the reasons why, uh, why the 
European Space Agency builds C-band radars <laughs> because they don't want to deal with the ionosphere. Great questions. Okay, so um, what is so, RPI? Repeat pass interferometry. Um, so the it's not necessarily based on the ground track. The important parameter is the baseline, the perpendicular baseline. So um, we don't really get to control the orientation of that baseline. But you know, imagining the worst case scenario, if it was horizontal, then your ground track deviation would be the same thing as your critical baseline. So five kilometers in Sentinel-1 um, or one kilometer for the older satellites. Um, so if that makes sense. So, but, you know, so the, the important thing is you have to do it from the same orbit of the satellite. You can't ever make interferograms between two neighboring orbits or two crossing orbits anything like that. The satellite has to be on the same orbit flying in almost exactly the same location. So, um, and some SAR satellites uh, are launched without repeating orbits because it takes a lot of fuel to keep that satellite repeating its orbit. Um, so, so some satellites that don't repeat their orbits precisely, you may not be able to do interferometry because they won't have, you know, within five kilometers or within, uh, you know, a kilometer ideally for their baselines. So we should assume it to be equivalent to critical baseline. Yeah, I would say that's a good assumption. Um, you can just treat it the same way. Great. Okay, well, why don't we move on? We're, we're not actually behind schedule because the last talk has been by Katya on SAR data access and NISAR will be tomorrow. Um, so we just have one more presentation by Shawa, and he, I don't think he's online anymore, but he recorded it um, earlier, and I think Melissa will play it back. Just to say a couple things about, I think he'll probably say this about SAR acquisition modes, but when I talked about the, the limitation on the swath width, um, this is, this whole thing about ScanSAR and TOPS is it, is an effort to get around that limitation, make a wider swath than normally you could have. So, um, so Jawa is, can play it. Go ahead and play it. Thank you. Okay, let's get uh, started. So at this part, we'll be going through SAR acquisition modes. Um, we have gone through some of the theory of SAR, um, but mostly just for street map data, uh, which is um, consistently observing the same uh, stripe uh, on the ground. Now we'll see some variants of it. Uh, sweep SAR, I mean, scan SAR, TOPS, uh, and a little bit of sweep, uh, sweep SAR, which will be the main acquisition mode uh, for the future NISAR mission. Um, scan SAR basically is a time division multiplexing system. Uh, you could divide the orbit into uh, slits uh, to observe different parts of the Earth. For example, you can eliminate the first subspots uh, or the, this part of the ground for a period of time, and, and then move to observe the next subspace. Uh, if you keep moving and then loop the observations back to the first subspace again, um, you are actually doing scansar. So basically, the observations are divided to eliminate different uh, subspace uh, as the satellite goes along the orbit. Uh, each time the satellite makes a measurement uh, or a subspace, uh, we call it a radar burst. And the purpose of scansar could be largely uh, illustrated by this figure here. The smaller box is the footprint of a frame of ELOS-1 uh, street map data. The larger box is the footprint of ELOS-1 scansar data. Uh, basically, if you want to map the Earth at a very large scale uh, at the cost of lower resolution, uh, scansar is the way to go. Uh, scansar has this advantage of covering a large area of Earth's surface, uh, but it comes with a cost. First, of course, the resolution is lower um, especially along the azimuth uh, track direction, uh, it is degraded. Um, but also uh, because you are observing from different parts of the uh, orbit, you have to make sure that uh, every time you uh, observe the ground, it is from the same parts of the orbit. Or in other words, uh, the radar burst uh, must overlap uh, to do interferometry. Um, 
basically, if the illumination is misplaced, uh, as shown here, um, you, oops, <laughs> basically, if the illumination is misplaced, as shown here for reference and, and repeat, um, th that means the observation are uh, made at different part of the orbits. Uh, and the result won't be coherent anymore. In other words, they are looking at the same target, uh, but from different angles. Uh, so the, the results are incoherent. Uh, if things work well, uh, you get burst uh, aligned uh, and you get coherent fringes, like what's shown here for the 2014 Napa earthquake. Uh, this is the post seismic pair, which is uh, uh, with the post seismic signal mainly located here, and all the fringes are more or less uh, from atmosphere. Uh, but if you are unlucky, you get nothing. And just as shown in this interferogram, things are basically just noise uh, and you can't get any signal out of it. Uh, the reason um, you have this uh, is uh, here's an analysis from um, Xiaopeng that showed with the drift of the burst overlap, which is shown by this uh, figure on the right, uh, the coherence uh, generally drops. And you need about like 20% of uh, mm, burst overlap to get coherence uh, about like 0.2, which is roughly the level you know, for like usable fringes. Uh, and ELOS-1 had this uh, burst drifting problem. Uh, so its scanser data are actually largely unusable for interferometry purpose. Uh, the right-hand side, uh, uh, actually at the very top, you have high uh, burst overlap and the bottom you have low burst overlap. So you can see that at the top, you can see coherent fringes, but at the bottom, uh, things are getting really bad and you can't really get any signal out of it. Uh, here's another example by Yu, uh, Yu Morishita, and that is from really early ELOS-2 data over Hokkaido uh, in Japan. Uh, this pair has about a, like 19% uh, burst overlap, uh, and you, you have to do like tons of filtering to get these fringes out of the data. Uh, and if you dig really hard into the data, uh, you see that, I'm going to directly see like how the radar bursts are uh, misaligned. Uh, the two images are placed uh, by aligning the coastlines, as you can see, but the center of the burst are off by about like 340 uh, lines in the data. Uh, and the width of the burst, I think, is about like 420-ish. So you can almost like predict what's going to happen when you have these uh, bursts misaligned. Uh, it turns out that like later on, Ryu Natsuyaki from JAXA found that uh, there is about like 56-day cycle of this burst drift. And they fix this problem by reducing like one line of observation from a certain subspace, like every, like, I don't know how long time uh, to prevent the burst from drifting. Uh, so after like February uh, 2015, um, that problem got fixed. Uh, and it was just in time to capture the 2015 uh, Nepal earthquake. And this was the first time that ELOS2 scans are captured such a large event. Uh, if data from a strip map, you can imagine like how many like strips of data you have to use to capture such a large event. Uh, so Scansar really has its advantage occurring these large earthquakes. Um, however, we also noticed that sometimes um, you get like really strange patterns of decorrelation as shown in this figure, uh, where everything seems to be working fine, but at a certain places you get this really strange uh, like ripples. Um, the problem is caused by like interference between like different uh, radar bursts. Uh, what's shown here is sort of like describing what's happening. If you ob the Earth, observe the Earth from uh, different parts of the orbit, uh, then different parts of the orbits might interfere, just like uh, this uh, experiment showed over here. Uh, and on the top here is actually a strip map data for the two corner reflectors at the pendant flat. Uh, so after focusing, you see just like two bright spots in the image. But for Scansar data, like these two uh, corner reflectors are being interfered and you see like a multiple of these uh, speckles uh, around these corner reflectors. Um, but luckily you can also, I mean, try to fix this by excluding the speckles uh, uh, or excluding the cross, cross correlation to like uh, non-major peaks um, um, using a specific method, but uh, this problem can be fixed. Uh, other than the interference problem, Scansar also has this problem called amplitude scalloping, which is due to the burst acquisition mode itself. Uh, the figure here shows the, the difference between a strip map uh, and a Scansar image for the same uh, area on the Earth. Uh, you notice that the brighter zones are the places where you have uh, direct illumination from the satellite, and the darker zones are uh, like in between them. 
Uh, this is called amplitude scalloping. Uh, to mitigate such kind of problem, uh, the SAR engineers have developed another type of scan SAR uh, called terrain observations of progressive scans, which is called top SAR. Um, the idea is simply that the, the radar is scanning uh, a, a certain subsource. Uh, while it's scanning, its antenna also sweeps from backward looking to forward looking. And then you observe the next subswells and next subswells and then comes back. And you make sure that the backward looking and the forward looking actually can be um, uh, stitched seamlessly. Um, uh, the idea sounds really great, uh, but uh, it brought uh, up new challenges. Uh, the main problem is introduced uh, is actually from the antenna sweeping, it introduces an extra Doppler along the azimuth. And because the sweeping is, uh, the, the Doppler is so big, it goes way beyond the Nyquist, which is the PRF uh, or pulse repetition frequency. Uh, remember that it was discussed earlier that the PRF has to be larger than the Doppler so that it, could, it can be, uh, the radar data can be sampled direct, uh, properly. Otherwise, you may get aliasing uh, if you try to sample the data. But with the sweeping of the antenna, um, there's just no way to maintain such a high PRF, uh, which is typically about like 4K hertz. Uh, considering the PRF has to be small enough uh, to give time to, to read our echoes to, to uh, uh, scan the ground. Mm, here's another uh, illustration. If you uh, unwrap the spectrogram, uh, the difference uh, at the burst overlap uh, from forward looking to backward looking uh, is about 4.5 hertz. Uh, one issue with this is uh, that since the spectral ramp is higher than the PRF, one could not directly sample the images properly. Otherwise, it could cause aliasing, as we said. Uh, this also means any azimuth or misreservation will be magnified uh, by this spectral difference um, and get reflected in the infrared. Just imagine that you have a, a misreservation that moves forward a little bit. For forward looking, the phase actually uh, like increases a little bit, but for backward looking, it actually decreases a little bit. That's causing the sensitivity to azimuth or motion. Uh, a rough estimate is that one has to co-register uh, the image to better than a thousand of pixel to be able to not see any discontinuities uh, from the radar phase map. Uh, so how are we going to process the data? Uh, traditionally, uh, what is used for co-registration is called cross-correlation. Uh, basically, it cross-correlates the different parts of the image, uh, calculate the transform function, um, we call it I-fine transformation, and then resample the radar images to, to match the, the reference. Uh, but the accuracy is typically around like 0.1 pixel, uh, which is far not enough for TOPS data, uh, as we said, a thousand so pixel. Um, so we turn uh, to another approach, uh, which is to correct the radar image purely using the information from the satellite orbit. Uh, this heavily relies on the accuracy of uh, the orbit product from Sentinel-1. Uh, but luckily for Sentinel-1, it's about like two to three centimeter radio and uh, about a five centimeter long track, which is really, really accurate orbit. Basically you calculate for uh, a position uh, on the ground uh, in, in the radar coordinates uh, for the reference image and for the uh, repeat image. So basically you have the position um, and the differences between the reference and repeat. Um, then using this table, you can actually uh, for one, one way to compute this iPhone transformation using these numbers, but also on the other way, you can actually map these numbers um, to create a pixel by pixel correlation. Uh, here's a brief comparison of the algorithms. Uh, uh, the deramping and reramping is to, to allow you to sample the radar image properly, which is removing the effect from the sweeping antenna. Um, and another difference is uh, that because the geometric calculation is faster, um, this uh, offset estimate are actually done pixel by pixel. Uh, this allows you to do it that way uh, and actually performs better uh, when the elevation change in, uh, in, the, in the radar image is high. Oops. And this is a result after doing a geometric correlation and all the seams or I mean the discontinuities between bursts are gone. And also for the coherence, uh, you see the darker lines are getting uh, a little bit lighter. Uh, they still exist, uh, which is because uh, over those seams you have forward and backward looking, which degrade the coherence a little bit. Um, the geometric modules works really well. Here's a test that we did years ago, uh, that if you sum up all the, the interferograms one way, and then 
subtract from another way, uh, essentially you're going to get zero. Uh, uh, this is the baseline time plot, by the way. Uh, so every point uh, is a SAR acquisition uh, with the horizontal axis being time and the vertical axis being uh, the baseline um, or its uh, position in space. Uh, and every line connecting two mm, uh, acquisitions is actually an interferogram. Uh, if you close the loop, just sum around the loop, uh, you essentially get uh, close to zero, which is shown by the bottom right plot here. And lastly, we do have this module in GMPSR called Enhanced Spectral Diversity, which is basically a way to improve uh, correlation by estimating the phase difference at the uh, burst overlap region. Uh, you could see the improvement made uh, by this technique from left not doing spectral diversity and right hand side doing spectral diversity. Um, uh, it is not the default mode for GMPSR, uh, as we want users to be a bit more careful when uh, what they are removing uh, using such technique because it's not just removing uh, misreservation, but sometimes like real tectonic motion along the azimuth direction um, could happen. And instead of using this technique, you're removing that, uh, removing that motion as well. And here, the summary of the processing chain of TOPS mode data in GMPSAR. Uh, I'm going to uh, skip this slide, but basically the key part is this middle one, uh, which is deburst SLC and apply uh, correlation. Uh, it's divided into four steps, deramp the data, um, uh, apply the range and atoms shift, and then re-ramp the data. Uh, and I mean, resample the data and then, then re-ramp the data. Uh, all right, finally, uh, sweeps are just a little bit about sweeps are. Uh, I want to cover this a little bit because um, NICER is approaching and this will be its main acquisition mode. Um, I mean, Katya probably could uh, add more to this part because she knows a little bit more. Um, so traditional acquisition modes um, will directly transmit the radar signal from the antenna to the ground. Uh, so the shape of the antenna sort of determines the footprint on the ground, like and because it's a rectangle antenna, so uh, on the ground is more like a, a like a circle or uh, or eclipse. Um, that that is also the reason why most uh, street map data the width is about like seventy kilometers. It's sort of limited by the antenna. Uh, there, however, is another way of expanding the acquisition area other than scansar, which is to use a reflector on the top of your satellite and face the antenna toward the reflector. Uh, this way, different part of the antenna when hitting uh, the reflector are essentially sending signal to different parts uh, like on the ground. You could sort of do this uh, as scansar, uh, like lighting up different parts of antenna like sequentially and then observe different part of the ground um, and then receive the signal. Uh, it's exactly the same as you are doing scansar, except you have this uh, reflector on top. Uh, however, this is a, actually a waste of the potential of this design uh, as you are basically using only part of the antenna uh, at one time. Uh, and another idea is to just illuminate the whole antenna at the same time, uh, but you need to tune the face of the antenna so that they are focused on a, a very narrow stripe on this reflector. And because it's really narrow, then when you're hitting the ground, uh, basically you can sweep a, a really, really wide swath. Um, and the good part about this design is that when different parts of the uh, signal coming back from the ground, uh, they are essentially going to uh, arrive a different part of the antenna. Uh, for example, this part will arrive at the first cell, and then the second part will be uh, arriving in the second cell. Uh, but more importantly, they, when they arrive, they are also arriving at a different time uh, because uh, this is a little bit closer to the uh, antenna and that's a little bit further. Uh, so if tuned properly, uh, the antenna could be receiving multiple radar echoes, uh, taking advantage that the echo from different part of the ground arrives at antenna at different location and different time. Um, and it's sort of similar as sweeping the ground uh, at the antenna. So that is also called uh, sweep on receive. Um, and, and because of this design, uh, you could also mitigate the effect of low PRF uh, caused by the extra wide swaths. In other words, for sweeps are, you don't have to like firmly obey the PRF rule. Uh, so what's shown here is actually an example from uh, the GPL website uh, where you see the signals are getting sweeped uh, I mean, it's sweeping the, the 250 kilometer uh, wide swaths. Uh, and in fact, you have two beams being received or, or recorded by the antenna at the same time. Uh, I also have to mention here that the antenna could not be used to transmit uh, signal and the receive signal at the same time. So whenever it transmits, uh, like when this part turns red 
and uh, you lose some return echoes. Uh, but since the footprint overlaps uh, from one to another, uh, when you are focusing the data, one could essentially interpret it through these gaps. Uh, and the engineering design could make this happen here and there, not like consistent at one place. So the data quality is largely unaffected. Uh, so this is the basic theory of uh, sweeps are. Uh, any, any questions? Uh, feel free to ask your questions or leave the question in the chat. Thanks. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, I see some hands. Okay. Thank you, Jawa, even though you're not here right now. If you do have questions, I think you could probably put them in the Slack channel that I haven't really used yet, but it's a good way to see the questions and answers that everyone is asking. Um, any other questions about anything? Uh, tomorrow we'll have more presentations, but if you have questions about, you know, INSAR or even processing questions, now is a good time to ask because you have all the experts in the room. Um, I, I have a question if um, no one else does real quick. Um, and this might be better for when Katya gives her presentation, but do we know how similar the NISAR data set is going to be to Sentinel? Like how like how that's going to affect various modules in GMT SAR? I don't know. I mean, Katya could probably answer and Jawa because he's act, he's taken the simulated um, NISAR data and tried to write some from the aircraft and tried to write some um, modules. Uh, but I don't know the answer. Uh, maybe someone else knows better. Now there, you can download simulated NISAR data. So it's in the NISAR format and everything. So that must be what Xiaohua has been playing with, I guess. Yeah, I think he he figured out the formats, but um, the aircraft was uh, moving around a lot, and there was a lot of motion corrections that we thought we shouldn't deal with now because the satellite won't have all those issues. But, uh, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I guess. Um, well, yeah, I'm sure Katya and, and Eric will have, have more to say on that. But yeah, I know they're using the UAB SAR. I just didn't know what the data format itself looked like. Yeah. It's yet another format. <laughs> they all seem to be different. Personally, I'm excited about the geocoded SLCs. Yeah. Because um, then you don't have to do all the alignment and everything's all done for you. You just take the images and subtract. That would be great. Howard Zepker talks about doing it in something like Google Earth Engine. You could just put the geocoded SLCs in Google Earth Engine and process that way. Uh, Still have to yeah. do the unwrapping, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't see any more questions, so I think we could probably end this session a little bit early, which is great, but that means that tomorrow it could go a little long. So people should look at the agenda and tune in, especially to the things they want to see. We're going to cover um, a tour of two pass processing and then a lot on phase filtering and unwrapping, and then a, a, another discussion of atmospheric artifacts with a quiz. I think there's a quiz that Kang will give us um, which, which um, interferogram has the signal and which has the noise. Uh, and then um, Catherine Guns is out with COVID, but she did a recording and she's really the expert on, at least in our group, on batch processing and all the issues. And, and she wrote it, she and a number of people wrote um, a time series document that you can download from uh, the GMT SAR downloads area. And then we have some uh, five lectures on applications, which should be really interesting. Um, and I'm looking forward to that because things keep changing and we get new results all the time. So here's a 
question in the So we want the first one was please also quickly demonstrate batch processing and time series tomorrow. Yep. Okay. That's a tall order because it's like a I call it like a cooking show. You're cooking a big meal and it's going to take five hours, but you want to show it all in 30 minutes. So you got to have like all the steps done. But there is a pre-cooked um INSAR time series on the download site. Another question, how could we differentiate between types of errors like unwrapped DEM? Oh yeah, I think Kang will talk about this tomorrow, but that's that's a tough one. It's it's an art, I think. Uh, <laughs> Comes with experience. <laughs> I find that it's mostly not what you're looking for. <laughs> We would have students do interferograms for a class, and they always wanted to do a volcano or an earthquake, and they always found a groundwater signal or an atmosphere signal. So, um, yeah. Almost everything you see in an individual <laughs> interferogram is tropospheric noise. That's like 99.9% .9 of the time, all you can see in one interferogram is troposphere. So if you see anything really interesting and fascinating looking, it's tropospheric noise. Um, that's the that's the best answer is don't try to distinguish just assume it's always troposphere. Um, if you know unwrapping errors, you can tell because they'll often be like a really sharp jagged line going through your image that didn't have a sharp jagged line in the phase image. So I always compare the phase filt and the unwrap against each other. And if you see a sharp jagged line in the unwrap that's not there in the phase, that's an unwrapping error. Um, but you can also do you can also sum interferograms around a loop after unwrapping and the sum should be zero or two n pi for the whole thing. But if you get a spot that's not unwrapped correctly, it'll stand out. Um, we should have a library of bad interferograms, like a hundred of them or something. And so. <laughs> Somebody okay, here's it. Instagram. Here's a question about how to make east, north, and up from ascending and descending. And I sort of talked about that, but maybe else, someone else wants to answer that. I have a couple slides about that in my uh, slides tomorrow, slides okay. 18. Um, so yeah, it's you can if you add and subtract the the two, you tend to sort of sub separate them out into east, west, and vertical. But there's a little bit more you can do better than that if you know the direction that the direction that the displacement is going. Um, you cannot really get three components of displacement from only having two images, two directions. So you won't be able to calculate east, north, and up independently from each other. You can only get two of the three. So. Although with NISAR, maybe then we'll have a third look direction and we can do it then. I'm not sure. Because it's left looking, right? Yeah. So we'll have three separate look directions then. Oh, so here's a question about different unwrapping methods. And you know, there were there's a whole book on unwrapping by um, Pritt and Gilea and with lots of different methods, but it seems like the community is sort of settled down to the snafu as being the most reliable method. And um, there are lots of approaches, so. Do, do the students have access to uh, the lecture slides from today already? Have we sent the link of that? Uh, yeah, so as we, if you up your, upload your most recent version, there's a open area open to all the students with all the slides. Or we'll make sure it's open, so. Yeah, there's another, I mean, that's a great question about MAI, I don't know, Kong 
maybe you can answer. He's sort of the expert on that. So, uh, you see that question, Kong? It's about um, adding a third dimension using along track interferometry. Yeah, so just um, inside the measurement of one directional uh, change along the lamp side, so even though if you combine ascending and descending, it's still uh, two directions. If you want to decompose that into fully three dimensional, you have to get a lot of um, measurement uh, from, from the along track dimension. You can do that with MAI or um, often, oftentimes people use pixel tracking for large deformation processes like earthquakes. Um, yeah, but for um, slow move, slow moving deformation process, MAI uh, can potentially be used to to add to the lamp side deformation elements. But you know, MAI is uh, still it's relatively noisy um, compared to the conventional now set merriment. I think there's a module that you wrote, Kang. It's in GMT SAR. Yeah, it's in GMT SAR. And actually, I think Shaw had uh, improved that a lot. So it can, I guess it's called MAI. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know the name of the script, but it should be in, in the GMT SAR package. I posted Yuri's paper on the Hector Mine earthquake. So they did a 3D displacement recovery of um, the Hector Mine earthquake using ascending and descending and MAI. Uh, but it's the MAI is much noisier than the the two regular interferograms. So it's good for co-seismic displacements. Here's another question. And then we'll be out of time. Is it possible to estimate the uncertainty in LOS displacement given the different sources of error? I don't know who wants to address that. I can give it a try. Sure. Uh, so my understanding is that this is kind of an art and um, that there isn't really a straightforward way to do it because of the correlations in neighboring pixels and the correlations in time that we get with uh, the various sources of noise present in INSAR. So one method to do this is to create something called a variogram, where you look at the variability between neighboring pixels plotted as a function of distance. Uh, and you can see higher correlation in close by pixels because they experience similar tropospheric conditions. And then it de um, decays to a sort of floor in the, in the um, variability between pixels as you get into the uncorrelated distances, maybe 15 kilometers or more. Um, but this is empirical, it's done from the interferogram and it's it doesn't get us all the way there in terms of capturing the uncertainty, um, but there aren't other super established methods of doing it either. Great. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions and it's one o'clock. So um, it's lunchtime here in Europe. It's probably pretty late. <laughs> so um, thanks everybody for attending all morning or all day. And tomorrow we'll start at the same time. And we have, you, you saw the agenda and please bring more questions because I think this helps everybody to ask some of the basic questions that we don't even think about it anymore, but um, they're important. Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs>